Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Robin Koch. I'm a professor uh, in innovation entrepreneurship at the Antwerp Management School. And welcome at the uh, online, the first online uh, edition of the Growth Strategy Tour, which is part of the Master in Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Antwerp Management School. It is day three for us, and this day is also open for a larger uh, audience. This year's topic is all about accelerating business in uncertain time, uh, the New York versus the Tel Aviv perspective. So normally we would have been in New York and we would have been in Tel Aviv, but you can already guess what came in between, of course. But on the positive side, we easily fly back between uh, Tel Aviv and uh, New York. So till 12 o'clock we are in Tel Aviv and we are here to listen to three uh, perspectives on how corporates and startups uh, work together, uh, connect with each other to realize growth and innovation. Uh, so these are three separate uh, sessions with a small break of five minutes in between. Uh, we start off with the AB InBev um, view, then we move to the Antwerp Management School view, and then we get the perspective of uh, Microsoft. For the first online uh, talk, we focus on AB InBev, and we have two excellent speakers with us uh, today. Uh, Omer Ahif, who is a founder of a company acquired by uh, AB InBev, and Avi Kreimer, who is the global director of innovation at AB InBev. Um, Omer, not still not sure how to say this in an online uh, way, but the floor is yours. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Robin. Can you hear me well? I can hear you, perfect. Okay, okay, hello everybody. I cannot see you, but uh, um, I hope everybody is well. I'm very excited about this uh, talk. Uh, in the next 20 minutes, uh, I will tell you a little bit about my story. Um, as, a, as, a, as a founder entrepreneur and how we got the chance to collaborate with ABI and eventually be acquired. And then Avi will, will talk after me. So um, a bit about myself, I'm 38 years old. Uh, I've been doing entrepreneurship in high tech all my life since I'm 15, in fact. Uh, I really believe in starting small and fast. It's something that is very relevant for, for these days, right? Uh, when things are moving and dynamic, we need to be quick and, and agile. And uh, I really love this the, the, the whole product ideation thing. I've been doing it all my life in different industries. I've been developing products, inventing products in uh, uh, tobacco, uh, cigarette uh, tracking, uh, in... Um, uh, in uh, I've been developing services for mobile for mobile the mobile industry and the, back in the days and it's like I do, I'm not an expert for any subject but I I know how to find big problems and to provide them a good solution I think this is my expertise and what I'm gonna show you today uh, is basically a drill down about the latest company that I founded nine years ago called Weisberger and um, I will tell you the, a little bit about the, the story there. So basically, uh, nine years ago, uh, me and my uh, and a friend of mine, we started. Uh, we wanted to. We went to a bar, and we realized that basically, people are ordering beers from the main bar, and then they drink the glass in the bar, right? And we thought it will be very nice if we can put uh, if we can put a beer tap on their table so they can pour their own pint and pay it by the liter, uh, like in the gas station kind of thing. And that was kind of the MVP first idea that we had about the product in the beer industry. And we did like a very small pilot in Tel Aviv. We, we went to a bar and we persuaded them to put a beer tap with the kegs and everything under the, under the table of the consumer. And we put a screen that they showed in real time for each table. There were two tables connected how much each tap of each table was, was pouring. And we did like dynamic pricing. Every time people were drinking a bit more, they would be able to get an incentive. And we played with the pricing and we tried to see how it's affecting consumption. This was our first product MVP uh, testing and learning. 
okay? And basically, uh, it started very small, but we realized that we are, we, are, we are able to solve a very big problem of the beer industry overall. All the breweries in the world, Heineken, Carlsberg, even bev- other beverages like Coca-Cola and Pepsi and other CPGs, they have the same problem of the bullwhip effect, right? Of the whip. Like the, the customer is very far away from the manufacturer. So the manufacturer, let's say AB InBev, doesn't really know how people consume their brands. They don't know their market share in real time. They don't know the competitive analysis, the pricing for the consumers. They are living in the dark because it's a push mechanism. The whole industry and buoys are selling to bars and bars are selling to consumers. But Coca-Cola, ABI, Heineken, all these companies, they never knew in real time how much people actually consume their brands every day, every hour. So therefore, it was a disconnected value chain. So he said, if we could connect the table, what if we could connect the whole bar and connect the taps and the point of sale, the electronic point of sale that logs all the transactions, what the, what the, what the bars are selling out to consumers, if we could log that, we can do magic. We can actually uh, provide data for the bar and for the, for the brewery and optimize the, the value chain. So we developed basically a, pl- a platform or a product that is based on two, two topics. One is a dashboard for the bar owner. Second is a dashboard for the brewery. We connected the point of sale and we had flow meters installed on the beer lines of the bar, of the beer taps. And we collected all the data in real time and we fed two dashboards. So we can, we can communicate and, and do dynamic pricing and promotions in, in real time, like, like happening in Google AdWords on, on, on the internet and online. We became, we connected the non-connected industry, right? We took the offline and connected it to become an online industry. And basically, I could not show you here a video, but you can go to YouTube later on and search for beverage analytics. That's the name of the old platform. There's a nice video of how we persuaded pokes, uh, bars, and restaurants to, to connect their point of sale and taps. So we gave them a, a solution, a dashboard with a beer waste measurement, with statistics, with a comparison to the market. And that was an ex- like a, a good uh, reason for them to give us the data so we can feed the breweries. Okay. And the journey was very tough, okay? It's not like uh, uh, it was bootstrap. We didn't have any money. Uh, I put all my money in 2011 that I had uh, in, the, in the company. There was no salary, of course. But very, at the beginning, we had to raise money from private angels investors. We raised $100,000 at the beginning. We gave some shares. And then we got, after half a year, to another milestone. We raised another half a million dollars and had another another $2 million. And basically, after uh, eight years, we we had 20 investors that invested um, a good chunk of a few millions of dollars and were able to be sustained, like uh, strong enough and to have presence in Europe and in North America. And um, we I must say that the journey was not easy because we had to, we almost went bankrupt a few times. There were times that we could not pay salaries where we found a solution. We were very agile and we also pivoted twice. So in nine years, there was a big, it was like a snake move, right? We had to find our place. It wasn't so clear, but we had to test and learn very quickly what is the right product for the right market to fail very fast. It was part of the things we learned. And, uh, so the investors are a very important part because they also fuel us with funds, but also they help us with advice. So the people we chose are very, very small people relevant for the beer, food and beverage industry. Um, and basically we worked with who, a, a, any beverage company out there. We work with also with distributors. We, found, we even start to work with Vodafone as a reseller for a solution for bars in, in Belgium. And we started to work with uh, Coca-Cola and ABI and Heineken. But ABI was really the best in class uh, customer we had, the biggest, the most, the fastest, and the most uh, enjoyable to work with. They were really adaptive uh, to take our products to the next level. And basically, very quickly, uh, like in 2012 or 13, we already went outside of Israel because Israel is a very small country. Uh, we are eight and a half million people. Uh, beer consumption is very, very low here. It's it's not like in Belgium, 
unfortunately. And we had to go and search for customers in Europe and North America and Asia very quickly in 2012-13. So our ambition was to connect the bars of the world, to connect them uh, into one platform so we can feed breweries with the data and, and, and optimize the value chain. Um, and we realized that the best strategy in 2017, we realized that the best strategy to do it fast at scale is to collaborate with the biggest brewery in the world, which is AB InBev, which is an amazing company, um, um, very modest company, very straightforward and, um, and uh, innovative, as Avi will show you. And we, we agreed basically to sell the company, the shares, and to become one with AB InBev and, and basically deploy the platform to all ABI markets. All the bars and the, and the restaurants of the, of the markets of ABI are being basically, most of them are being introduced with the product to connect um, bars and restaurants and to get their data so we can help them sell more. So ABI is, um, the journey started as a client and in 2017-18 we acquired and now we are part of the business. I'm leading the connected bar product for AB InBev and we have um, basically 100 people right now. Most of them are data engineers, data tagging people, software engineers, analysts, and uh, data scientists. Um, and we're operating in eight main markets of ABI, and we are very focused on taking the point of sale data and cleaning it, matching it, normalizing it. It's one big factor. The second thing, we're doing product development. We're providing mobile apps and dashboards and algorithms. And the last thing is optimization algorithms. So we can... We can, using big data, we can find amazing patterns. So for example, what's the, bar, the best price for Stella Artois and what time of day for what bar in Brussels? It's like an optimization problem based on mathematics. Now with the data, we can do it right. We can optimize. Or uh, how can I optimize the supply chain so I can reduce the out of stock incidents, right? So I can have lean, very lean, lean manufacturing. It's based on big data, right? All of these algorithms are based on optimization and math that we do with the data. So that's what we're doing with 100 people here in Tel Aviv. And and basically, um, before I, I, I let um, Avi uh, to, to, for his part, I wanted to say that I, if I had one big advice uh, for people that want to be entrepreneurs or to to innovate, is to start small and just start swimming. And to do less planning and more to actually doing in the field, this is the best uh, advice I can give because there are some things that we can only learn when we do and fail fast. And uh, we can do 100 presentations and work in our office and, and right? It, we will not figure out only if we do. So I think agility, speed, uh, start small, uh, test and learn. These are the key highlights of entrepreneurship, and I'm very glad that we are now part of AB InBev, doing it at scale. We're still doing a lot of innovation and testing and learning and failing very fast, so we can extrapolate and, and expand the things that are working. Uh, and I'm very happy that we're also able to help the bars and the restaurants of the world now with the COVID-19. Uh, it's not an easy... It's not an easy time for them. A lot of uh, bankruptcies, right, of restaurants. And using data, we can help them um, uh, revive by telling them what's the right price for the right SKU, to have the right assortment, uh, how to optimize their menu. Now, when things are so fragile, using data, we can help them optimize their business and, and help them sell more. And we are tracking also for ABI all the trends, the consumption trends in the main markets, because we, in real time, we know who consumes what, in what time of the day, so we can optimize promotions or to, to help the industry to recover. So this is um, my uh, 10 minutes uh, key highlight, and I'm very much looking forward to your Q&A later on. Thank you, Omer. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, I can imagine you already have quite some uh, questions uh, by now, but uh, let's first move to the uh, second uh, presenter of today, 
Um, and meanwhile, I'm going to upload uh, his uh, presentation. Um, the second uh, speaker of the day, like I said, is uh, Avi uh, Kremer. And Avi is the uh, Global Director of Innovation at uh, AB uh, InBev. And he will give us the uh, perspective of the uh, corporate of uh, AB InBev. Well, we already had the perspective of OMEF as, as a startup being acquired by a bigger uh, corporate. We now have the other uh, side uh, explained by uh, Avi. Okay. All right. But we nice. are all set now, and uh, I will make you presenter, uh, Avi, so you can uh, move uh, your slides, and then we're all set to go. Okay, great. So I'll start with, uh, first, first of all, Robin, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm really excited to be here talking to you guys, and hopefully Robin, next time we'll be, we can make it in person, we can do it in person. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, our tech innovation team here at the AB InBev. We call it the Beer Garage. Uh, before that, I'll tell a few words about myself. So my background is actually technical. I started as a software engineer uh, back in Israel after my university studies. And then after a few years, kind of more in, a more, in more technical roles, I decided I wanted to transition to the business side. And so I actually moved to the U.S. It was about eight years ago. I moved to the U.S. I did my MBA at uh, Kellogg, close to Chicago. And then I went to consulting. And then in 2016, I joined ABI in our global headquarters in uh, New York City. Um, there are held different positions, uh, always in the technology function, uh, working on scaling up uh, tech initiatives, working with the sales and logistics functions mostly. And then um, I transitioned to our innovation function, to our tech innovation function. And that's what I've been doing since then for about a year now, more or less. So we can go to the next slide. Ah, I can, uh, I'll move. All right, so we've actually, we have, uh, currently we have two locations, but the first location that we had was the big garage in the Valley. Okay, this was started years ago. And around 2018, um, around the acquisition of Weisberger, actually, this is why the story also kind of ties together, because Weisberger does, uh, did have a, a big role in us actually exploring the Israeli tech ecosystem. Um, we basically decided to say, to see that, you know, the, the tech ecosystem is very strong, and I'm going to go through it uh, in the next few slides. And we want to actually collaborate and partner with this ecosystem across the chain of ABI. So not only in the in the sales sector, not only in the cyber sector, but also in terms of uh, procurement and sustainability efforts and manufacturing and logistics and sales and marketing and HR technology. We can actually play uh, within this ecosystem across all these areas that are throughout our company, throughout the ABI. Um, so we basically decided to establish our um, tech innovation office in Tel Aviv. And at that point, a few months ago, I actually moved back from the US to Israel to open the office. So a little bit about the, the Israeli startup ecosystem, okay? So we all know that the, the heart of the ecosystem is basically the, the startup, the 6,000 plus startups that we have, right? But I think it's very important to understand kind of what's under the hood and why do we actually call it an ecosystem. And in order to understand that, I think we need to understand what are the kind of the underlying players in this ecosystem and how can they work together to actually establish it as a real and a very strong tech ecosystem that that produces all this innovation and all those startups. Okay, so the the kind of the first one is the military, right? So not sure if you're aware, but the military is mandatory in Israel. So men serve three years, women serve two years, and within our military, we have our technology units, right? Because we basically understood that our advantage uh, is not through size or quantity. It's actually it could actually be through technology and our quality. Right, so we have very strong technology units, and the way it translates uh, afterwards is that those young soldiers that are basically trained on the most cutting edge technologies since they're 18 years old, when they finish the military, they become entrepreneurs themselves, right? And they build tech companies that basically use those technologies that they've learned about in the past and applying it to a different world. Okay, an example could be an agrotech company. Um, that is actually uh, monitoring and tracking using computer vision what's going on in the field and can provide recommendations to farmers on how to grow their crops, right? 
And if you kind of think about it going backwards, you can think about that, you know, they came from an intelligence unit that used computer vision to realize things that are related to our country's safety, right? So this is kind of the, the process, just to give an example. Then the second player is, is academia, right? So in Israel, uh, the best universities are the, the public ones, right? Unlike in the US, where it's the other way around. And Israel is ranked number two across all the OECD companies in terms of the most educated country in the world, okay? Um, tied with Japan right after Canada. So there's a lot of things that are going to the academia, and the academia is also very kind of tech-driven, and, and even the, the research that is being uh, kind of started or established in the labs, and you can even think of Mobileye as an example of, uh, of, uh, of a, a company that eventually was acquired by Intel for more than $15 billion. It started in the university with a few professors in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And so even the university is very strong in terms of uh, technology and actually driving it into the commercial world. And then besides that, we also have a lot of accelerators, incubators. And the nice thing about them is that um, they're very focused, right? So um, they're focused in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, tech areas. And then they're also focused in terms of stages. So you'll have like an incubator for companies that just started and they just maybe raised like a pre-seed money. Uh, you have accelerators for companies that, you know, already raised their seed money, they have a product. You have scalerators for companies that can actually scale and are ready to work with, uh, with, the, with the big players and scale their products uh, across the world. And then on the other hand, it's also by area. So you have, you're, you have incubators that are focused more on health tech, uh, health tech, incubators that are more in the diverse tech space, the commercial space, the, the retail tech space. And so on both of those arenas, uh, they're very, very contributing to, to our ecosystem. And then the next player is actually, you know, the government and the public authority. So the government is a very active player in the ecosystem. And there, there's a lot of programs that, that help uh, the ecosystem thrive. A few examples are, you know, the obvious things like, you know, tax incentives. Um, but beyond that, um, there's actually programs where, um, where the government enables other sectors in the population to become more involved in the tech ecosystem. For example, the ultra orthodox community, which is not very engaged in the ecosystem, they provide different incentives, different programs that to become part of the this uh, this sector in Israel because we understand that for us the tech sector is the number one sector that is actually helping is the, the the growth of the engine of the country basically. Um, so that's just one example. Also geographically, we know that most of the startups, you know, kind of compared to the US, they're either in the valley or in New York. So in Israel, most of the startups are around Tel Aviv. So the government is actually giving incentives for tech companies to open up in the north and in the south. So for example, in the south, they built, they built a, a cyber hub for cyber companies. And then you see that it actually helped the, 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 the southern part of Israel to become part of the sector as well. And then the next one, the next player is the, the multinationals, right? They're opening R&D centers and innovation centers in the country. And I'll go through it in the next slide, but there's basically many companies understanding that Israel is a, is a huge hub for innovation and technology. So they establish their presence in different models uh, in the country. One model could be an acquisition like we did with Weisberger. Another model is an innovation center like we, like we did uh, with my case or a cyber hub. So that there's many different examples. And then lastly is obviously VC. So there's a lot of money being ingested into the ecosystem. And, and even there, the government had actually, actually had a program where uh, back, I think it was in the 70s, where, where we wanted the VC money. There was a program called Yosma, Yosma means initiative in Hebrew, where basically the government matched every dollar to dollar, every foreign VC money that was invested in the, in the ecosystem. For example, if you invested $1 million as a VC, as an American VC, for example, the government will match it and you'll have $2 million worth of equity in that startup. Okay, so that was really, really huge in terms of um, driving funding to the, the ecosystem. So I'll move to the next slide, which hopefully will work now. Okay, so this one works. So um, as I mentioned, maybe many corporates and VCs are already benefiting from this ecosystem. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a few stats. So Israel is ranked, ranked number one in terms of number of start startups outside Silicon Valley, and number one in the world in terms of per capita VC investment, per capita R&D spend. But you can also say, okay, per capita is not a big deal. It's very small, around 9 million people. But in absolute numbers, it's very impressive. 
So if you think of the VC investment, it's more than 5 billion, which is equivalent to Canada and France, right? Or much bigger than, uh, than, than Israel, obviously. Um, even also absolute number is number three in the world in terms of foreign companies listed on NASDAQ. Number three in terms of registered patents, okay? Uh, so even in absolute numbers, this tech ecosystem is, is impressive and there are enough reasons to actually play within it. And then on the right hand side, you can see the different uh, corporations that are that are um, playing within this within this ecosystem. Um, so you can see it's it's cross sector. So obviously you have the the Googles, the Intels, there's the the tech companies of the world, but there's there's others from from different sectors, from the auto tech sector, which I think uh, General Motors was one of the first auto company that you know established the hub in Israel because they understood that the car would become a tech entity on its own. And then the nice thing about this, this ecosystem is that as a big player, you can actually help shape it, right? It's, it's very elastic, I would say. So once GM, for example, came into the ecosystem and then the, 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 the entrepreneurs, the therapists saw that there's needs, they actually expressed what they were, what they needed from the ecosystem, what were the challenges where technology can play a role. You could see that there were other companies that basically established uh, due to their needs. And now nowadays Israel is one of the, most thriving auto tech ecosystems in the world, even though, by the way, we don't manufacture any car here. Not even one car is being manufactured in Israel currently. Um, so that's a little bit about that. And obviously you can see our peers here, Coca-Cola, Pepsi has, has a presence here. There's a little bit of like a FOMO. I don't know if you guys know what, what FOMO is for, fear of missing out. Uh, that the company say, okay, we're dealing a little bit with technology, let, let's establish a hub. My, my, kind of, my, my kind of point here is, Make sure you do it in the right way um, because you don't want to burn yourself in the ecosystem, right? Because this ecosystem is very, very connected. You want to make sure that you establish it the right way. You have the right model. You have the right people. You have the right needs. You have the right funds. You have the right stakeholders. You also have to make sure that you build it right internally. It's a very, very, very important part, which I'll get to in, uh, right now in the next stage. So I'm going to move to the next one. All right, so basically, uh, now I'm talking about more about the internal piece, right, which is also very, very crucial. And I'll try to go fast because I still have like uh, five more minutes. So there's basically three pillars, right? There's the partner pillar, okay, which I'll focus the most about, which is basically partnering the, with the external ecosystem. Then there's an incubate pillar where um, we have a program um, where we, it's like a 10 or 11 week program. It's more internal where we say across the company, we kind of um, produce uh, some, um, some business problems, challenges that we want to solve and we don't see like a, you know, a, a ready product in the market for it. So we're trying to kind of build an MVP ourselves. So this is the incubate. And, there's a, and then there's invest. Invest basically, we at ABI, we have, uh, we have an entity called CX Ventures which invest in, in startups. So the way we collaborate with them is after we actually partner with the, with the startup and we do a successful collaboration pilot, um, we basically move it, uh, share it with, with, the, with the ZX team, and basically they can determine if they wanna do some kind of, a, of, a, of an investment in, uh, in that area, okay? So as I mentioned, let's focus on, uh, on this pillar. Um, so basically, Partnering, we basically source and vet startups through VCs, accelerators, conference, research, all those kind of different players that I just mentioned before. We collaborate with them. So it's, it's, this is the external piece. And then the internal piece is we are 80% aligned to our business priorities. We basically define briefs of business problems to make sure that we are solving business problems and it's not the other way around of a solution looking for a problem. For example, if I get a brief saying, I want to implement 5G technology in our warehouses, I'm going to ignore it. I don't care about it. it. I don't see any problem. I want to see what is the real problem that we're trying to solve. And then this is where I can get in and say, okay, which technologies fit, which companies fit, um, and how do we actually partner with them to do a pilot and then obviously scale up. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. A little bit about our process. I won't go into all the details, um, but basically listen. Listen means that we're actually doing the, the briefs as I mentioned, then explore. We are looking at technology using all of our partnerships within the, within the ecosystem to figure out who are the best partners. Then we prioritize, okay? So if you have a list of 50, you have to start kind of narrowing down the funnel. And we prioritize based on internal um, 
uh, alignment and also external understanding, you know, are these entrepreneurs, they're good enough, who, who invested in them, uh, how much money do they have, how innovative is the product, what, uh, what do other companies uh, that work with them think about it. Um, and then basically, we kind of move to the pilot phase, right? Because we're not building. Building is more about the, the incubator where we, we build something that doesn't really exist. And then we do the pilot. So kind of our role in terms of the, the pilot is understanding who do we work with, right? I'm global, so we need to understand we want to start with pilot in Europe, for example, in the in the, in the brewery, in the Stella Brewery, in Leuven. Um, and exactly what are the KPIs, what are the success criteria, and how do we build, build a future success roadmap together? And then for me, the next one, the next step, this is the most important one. How do we scale up, right? We're not doing tech innovation just, just for the sake of doing innovation because it's cool. We want, we want to scale it up because eventually the real business value in a company like ours comes when we scale it up, not to one brewery in, uh, in Leuven, but actually in our 200 plus breweries across the world, right? Um, and then during that pilot phase, we can actually kind of monitor and say, okay, guys, this is going really well in Europe. How about I know that Mexico also has a, has, a same, uh, has the same problem? Can we start actually implementing this, uh, this tech product there? Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is an example. I just want to give you a little bit of example of those steps that, that I mentioned. So we had our uh, supply team. Supply is basically our uh, manufacturing and logistics team came to Israel just before the, the shutdown of, uh, of the COVID, so thank God for that. And so they came here, and this is kind of the funnel. We started with, with an initial scouting, and then we did the filtration, and then we introduced them to the function. And then the function, the business function, actually selected a few that they want to explore for, for a pilot. Okay, so this is an example of how this process is going. Let's go to the next one. And by the way, we track everything in, in some kind of a CRM startup tool. So it's not sexy, but we want to make sure that everything is being tracked, right? So that we as a company, we know who did we interact with, what was the interaction, different comments, and then we can share it across our zones, right? Because the company is, uh, is huge. We have uh, more than 180,000 colleagues. We want to make sure that people are aligned and that we go to the, to the right startups and everything is documented. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just go with uh, with it, uh, Robin, without the, without yeah. the slide. Yeah, no worries. Um, so basically, on that side, what I want to share share an example is is what, what, what did we do in this in this kind of the visit that, that we had from the supply and logistics leadership, right? And um, so we started with with the conference, right? There was a there was a big industry 4.0 conference, and in that conference, our concept was we're not actually attending the conference. We're shaping the conference. So our chief supply chain officer did a keynote speech, and then we led a few different uh, panels, a few different roundtables to make sure that we express what are the needs that we have as a company and where can we partner with the ecosystem. We, we are here to do business. We're not here, you know, because Israel is beautiful. We want to make sure that we're here to do business and that we're solving our most pressing problems that will have a, an impact on our company. Okay, and um, so that was just uh, kind of my, my take on that slide. And then uh, on the next one is basically, I want to give you an example of how do we put it, how do we do it in a structured way. So we're actually established a, a concept of a cohort, right? So after we, we determine which ones we want to pilot with, we're actually doing some kind of a cohort uh, structure. This here obviously is a mess, but exactly, this is the, this is the slide, thank you, Robin. And so you can see that after we did the different uh, phases of uh, brief filtering, designing the pilot, etc., we're going to this uh, to this uh, cohort phase, right? Which is about three months, where we do this kind of uh, milestone evaluations with our internal stakeholders to say, okay, how things are going, which one we can scale, which one we should kill, which also fail fast, right? It's also part of uh, part of the way we the way we work, um, and then eventually, which ones are going for 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 scale? This is the last one, and we're planning to go around two to three cohorts a year, in a normal year, obviously. And then this is just uh, to give you an example of a, of a of a startup that we're collaborating with that actually is right now being piloted. It's part of the it's, the startup. His name is Oko. It's part of a sustainability efforts. Um, where the goal is basically to empower uh, our smallholder farmers, right? So this solution basically provides insurance for smallholder farmers uh, using satellite model technology, having weather data to basically uh, provide them insurance um, that can help them in, in, in crisis times, right? Um, they're backed by Barclays, they're partnered with, with Allianz, and 
in terms of internally, what does it mean? We actually got them in, uh, to part of the 100 plus accelerator. So the 100 plus accelerator in one word is basically a, an accelerator program for the sustainability function where we work with around 21 startups, if I'm not mistaken, to solve different problems that we have in our sustainability uh, area to actually achieve our 2025 sustainability goals. And Oco is an Israeli startup that is part of this, uh, of this company where we insure barley farmers in, uh, in Africa. Um, and this is, again, going to back to, their, to, the, to our 2025 goal to empower for the financial empowerment of those smallholder farmers. Thank you, Avi. We experienced some uh, technical problems from our side, but I think the uh, message uh, came across uh, really well. So thank you uh, for your input and for your story. Uh, so now I open up the floor for uh, questions, and I already saw a few questions uh, popping up. Uh, I think, um, Omer, you can join us with your uh, webcam also, because we got a question from uh, Hanna. Uh, Hannah is saying, once you were incorporated by a big player like EB InBev, what were the biggest changes for a startup like you? The changes, like after the acquisition? Yeah. I must say that uh, ABI, first of all, is a very, very smart company. They, they, they're they um, experts in, in M&As. So they made sure that the whole culture fit is is almost perfect i must say the personal connections the structure is like uh it wasn't like a big shift from a small startup to a corporate uh, i still operate the companies i used to do very agile i have a lot of freedom to operate we're doing it in partnership with abi so i i must say that i i don't feel a lot of change but i'm just i get better direction from instead of my board of directors I have an investors. Now I have the basically ABI leadership to tell me which markets are better to go to. And so this is the change. But uh, basically, I feel very independent. So it's not a big change from the daily basis. Okay. Thank you, Omer. Um, another question for Avi uh, How do you capture the problems to be solved by startups from within this huge uh, company? Okay, good question. So that, that goes back to part of our, our process, which is the listening part, right? And I think in order to do that, you need to have a very, very strong internal alignment, okay? The way that we're trying to do it is we make sure that we in our, in our team are connected to the right stakeholders in each function, okay, that are actually aware to the most pressing business problem. So this is why, as I mentioned, we start our, our engagement actually with the chief of the function, as I gave you guys an example with the manufacturing logistics. And then we basically kind of talk to their VPs and we talk to their directors and we talk to their managers. So, so there's a lot of conversations going on, right? It's not like we tell them, guys, here's a template for a brief and just send it over because it doesn't work this way. You have to be very diligent in this process. So you have to make sure that they understand how to do it. You kind of capture it. You help them. You kind of, you kind of, talk it back to them, make sure that you refine it together. And then I think you get to a situation, and this is how I, this is what I'm, I'm always trying to avoid that that was my kind of, always my speech to, to, our, to our business functions and partners is guys, let's avoid the situation of garbage in, garbage out. You give me garbage, I'll give you back garbage, right? Because I don't understand what, what's the problem, uh, who can we play with, et cetera. So we really try to avoid it, right? All of this is just to avoid garbage in, garbage out. And by doing this process of actually talking and having a defined template, filling it out together, refining it all the time. By the way, even after we did the first briefs, after a few months, we come back because there's always new things. Like things change constantly. Um, and once we gather those, then, only then, we go to the external part of actually kind of scanning the ecosystem, talking to the partner, to the investment uh, investment uh, arms, uh, talking to different startups, entrepreneurs, accelerators, all the players that I just mentioned. Only then, when we have something well-defined, we go there and then we start kind of mapping the, the right partnerships that we want to pursue further. Uh, further. Okay, thank you, Avi. That's very clear. Um... Maybe a question from my side uh, also. Um, what we've seen uh, is that um, corporate venturing is really evolving uh, a lot, right? So uh, back then you had acquisitions and you had joint ventures and corporate venture capital. Uh, but nowadays you see a variety of different ways 
that corporates and startups are connecting with each other. Uh, what is one of the things that you are quite excited about, which is one of the maybe newer forms of corporate venturing that you see around in Tel Aviv or in other places in the world? This one is for me or for uh, Omer? Uh, I think you can both answer, uh, but I first want to hear uh, how we <laughs> Okay, cool. So, so yeah, as you mentioned, there's 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 different types of uh, of uh, you know kind of corporate venturing. Um, th there's the, there's the part of obviously investing. There's the part of uh, acquiring, like we did with the Wisepeak. So, investing it, it goes more to our kind of the to the ZX Ventures uh, effort that, that we had. And obviously, w when we invest, we want to make sure that we we have a right to play, right? So probably make less sense for us to invest in a, in a cybersecurity company. Uh, but if it's, a, if it's a startup that actually does logistics work, then, I mean, ABI would be the best playground in, in the world for them, right? Because we have logistics in, in many countries in the world. Different logistics, very complex logistics are, are kind of, we work with wholesalers, we do it ourselves, different, 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 different types. And um, so th that, that would be more for kind of the, the investment. Um, acquiring, I think Omer can talk about it uh, better than me, as Weisberger has been an amazing example for that. Um, and besides that, obviously, there's there's a little bit of uh, kind of joint ventures, uh, which I personally I didn't do much here. Um, and there's the kind of the, the classical ones, which which we focus the most on, as, as I mentioned, which is partnering basically, is doing the, those pilots and then scaling them up to a to a global solution across our company. Yeah, I wanted to add, uh, I think each party need to ask themselves what is the strategy before they do any action. So, for example, if a startup is about to accept an investment by a big corporate like Coca-Cola, it will have an impact on the willingness of PepsiCo to collaborate, for example. Okay, so on the other, okay, so um, it's not so easy decision. Ah, okay, let's get an investment from a big corporate or uh, because it has an implication on the other market players. So, I, and on the other side, if a big company want to invest or to partner with a small company, they need to ask themselves, what is it for? To have better pricing, to have more control, to prevent competition, or to, uh, you know, to acquire eventually. And this will dictate the partnership model and the, the steps forward. Uh, so I, th I think it really starts, what David just said, it really starts from what is the, the strategy of the initiate, initiating side. Uh, Weisberger was was willing or was willing to uh, to to get acquired in order to fulfill a mission, fulfill a mission of ex global expansion. It wasn't for uh, getting acquired. It's not the goal, you know. So that was our strategy, and, and um, being able to collaborate with ABI fulfilled this um, this thing. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question regarding the process that was presented by Avi. Uh, in within uh, AB InBev, uh, how do you speed up the process uh, to go from problem to solution, or what is the timeline you have for this? It's a question from Olivier. Yeah, uh, good question. So the timeline differs, but the way that we've that we're trying to structure it, and again to align to our internal processes, is. We start with uh, with the brief definition, right? With the with the listening piece towards the end of the year, right? Where where you know we kind of establish our budgets, our priorities for the following year, right? So we want to make sure that we understand exactly what are the needs at that time, right? And then basically uh, at the beginning of the year we do kind of the explore phase, which is understanding what are the best partners, etc., right? And then in, in, in the first quarter, towards the end of the first quarter, we basically say, okay, guys, now we know who do we want to pilot with, right? And by that time, we have all of our plans in place, all of our, all of our stakeholders in place, uh, all of our budgets in place, also very important, right? Um, and then we can actually have a successful, uh, let's say, basis for a pilot. I don't know if the, if the pilot will be successful. It might be a, fa a complete failure. But at least we as a company internally, we built everything the right way and we got to the right moment where we can actually pilot and give this technology a real tryout, right? And it doesn't come in a time where, you know, uh, nothing is defined, the timeline is not there, the stakeholders are not aligned, etc. 
Um, and then towards the, the, the beginning of the second quarter, I would say, then we do this pilot. Usually the pilot takes around three months, I would say. And then we can have a decision again towards, if you think about the second half of the year, where we start planning for the next year, where we can think about scaling up. And this is kind of the logic around it. At the end of the year, you understand what are the problems. Then you explore in the first quarter, you actually pilot in the second quarter, and then you plan for a scale up in the second half of the year because the cycle continues. This is how we're doing it personally uh, at ABI. There's a follow-up uh, question on that, uh, Avi, uh, from Verle. In addition to all of your questions, to capture the magnitude of the process as a whole, how many people, FTEs, are working in each process step from the uh, ABM uh, process? Okay, so it's a, it a bit depends how do you define uh, how do you define it. I can tell you that uh, let's talk about my team. It's basically me and uh, two more people, right? So we're a team of uh, three. We also have a team in the valley, um, and it, it's hard to define it in, in an FTE level because it's it's a collaborative it's a collaborative process, right? It's you know part of my time will be dedicated to talk to you know to the supply chief and then then the, their VPs and directors. So it's, it's hard to define it in terms of FTEs, but in terms of our team size, it's with three people. In the Valley, we have five or six more people. Um, it's, it's, these are small teams, right? So don't expect a uh, huge organization. These are small teams that are very focused on the problems. They know who to talk to because you, you need to build it the right way that, as I said, you have the internal pipes in place. And then, you know, once everybody knows who to talk to, then you know the conversation is, is pretty quick. We all understand, we refine it, and then we understand what are the problems. Then we go ourselves, do the scanning, we come back, we work together. So it's hard to define it in FTs. I know that I don't have a, have a clear answer to this question. Um, but basically, one is everybody knows in advance who they're talking to. And, and second, guys, this is, a, this is a small team, very agile, uh, very nimble, knows how to, how to kind of navigate between different priorities, different stakeholders. And we go and run. And if we fail, it's okay. We fall down, we get up quickly, and we continue. Um, so it's not a huge team, um, but it's hard to, to, to answer in terms of number of FTEs. Okay, thank you, uh, Avi. A question for Omer from Andris. How did you experience the difference in size, power, and processes between the huge AB InBev and you being a small startup? I think that... Um... In many ways, we are the same. We are still, uh, we were a few tens of people, like 50, 60 people, or about 65 when we got acquired. Now we are a bit more. It's not a huge organization. Um, we kept on the structure of agile squads uh, working fast on product driven projects. So it's like we don't have one big team of 60 people working on something, we have squads of five people work on project on, on product A, product B, you know, and they are very uh, fast and agile working with ABI in the local zones. So I must say that I, uh, I feel that we are kind of the same. Um, I just don't have uh, investors anymore. I have, I have a stakeholder, which is like ABI leadership to help us understand where we're going and to fund the company. And we are just working for ABI. We're not working with Carlsberg or with Coca-Cola. We are very focused on ABI. It's big. It's like a huge market, right? We are the number one ape brewery in the world. We have a third of the global beer consumption. So we have 6 million locations in the world that we can go after and to connect and, and to provide value. So um, we are very independent. I, I feel like I didn't really change my routine, <laughs> which is not, it's not obvious because a lot of companies that acquire small companies Eventually, they fail very fast because they don't know how to how to cope with this creature, you know. But ABI is very, very agile, and I think we we got the freedom to operate. Okay, that's nice to hear, uh, Omer. Uh, we have a question from Katarina for Avi. Uh, you already um, talked a bit about it, but um, so do you do you start from a problem? Uh, as well and search for a startup that works within that space? Uh, do you have a yearly goal of um, number of uh, startups screened, an annual budget for the pilots, and how many uh, corporations continue after the pilot? Okay, um, so 
Yes, we start for the from the from the problem definition. Also, also remember that I mentioned that eighty percent is aligned to a problem, but other other things might be opportunistic. So I can also be reactive if there if there's a there's a startup that's a very cool solution in the, that solves a problem that we as ABI didn't think about. We're open to it. We're open for it as well, right? So also important to understand that we also have this this side. Um, in terms of in terms of kind of goals, so uh, my team's goals is is. It's kind of number of pilots and business impact. Um, so number of pilots, it's, it's easier, obviously, to quantify. Business impact is a bit trickier, right? Because there's different ways to, to calculate business impact, and you're not always sure as which scale will actually happen eventually because scale doesn't happen within one year, right? And our, our targets are yearly. Um, it can happen in, in three years, for example. So it's, it's, it's a bit trickier to, to quantify, it, but we basically go on on number of pilots and business impact. And business impact, again, comes back to, to the process, right? Which is which is always nice. We, we always try to kind of link it to the process. And then, uh, as you can tell, uh, we're very structured. We, we take innovation in a very, in a very structured way. And uh, because eventually the, the business impact, if it's big, it means that you got the right priorities, uh, you talk to the right people, you're solving the right problem that actually helps the company to move forward, grow, uh, help its uh, help its uh, its suppliers, etc. And um, that's in terms of that. And we do have also a budget for for pilots. We also have a budget for pilots for us, and also the functions sometimes have a budget. So we kind of work together on that. The budget for pilots are pretty small um, usually. Um, and once it goes into scale, then the then there will be a different discussion of budget, which is a bit less in in kind of my team scope. Okay, that's clear. Uh, any remaining questions from the students or from the audience, uh, please put them in the public chat, but I think we are uh, almost there. Um, maybe a question also, there are a lot of uh, startups coming out of our uh, program every year. Um, and there are quite some that, that also make it to the uh, scale up phase. Um, when is the right moment to come and talk with AB InBev and what are tips and tricks that are very important when you want to convince you guys uh, to collaborate? What would be then the uh, pitfalls maybe or what would be the, the tip or the key advice that you can give uh, startups when they pitch in front of a corporate like AB InBev? Omar, you want to take it? You want to take it? Yeah. Um, Someone has been very successful at it, Omar. Yeah, yeah, it's our success case, right? No, for my side, I think uh, try to be very practical. So always come with a not with a just with a nice deck presentation. Come with a proof of concept, with the facts, numbers, something in the field that you that you can bring a, a key stakeholders from ABI to come to, to to look to touch. It's very important to to be practical with ABI and to go very straightforward and to cover everything with data and numbers. That's my point of view. Okay. Yeah, complete, you... Completely agree with, uh, with what Omer just said. Um, very practical, understand exactly what you're solving. Be very specific on what you're solving that you're talking to the right person, right? And the last thing is also make sure that as a startup, you're in the right stage for yourself in terms of your product development, your plans, your roadmap, et cetera, to actually work with such a big player. Because, you know, working with a big player has a lot of advantages, but, you know, it comes with the, with responsibility, right? Um, so, you know, you have many stakeholders and there's a lot of pressure and it's international and you, meet, you need to meet the, the deadlines, the goals, the targets, et cetera. So you have to make sure that you as a staff, you're also ready and that you're not over committing to such a player because eventually, both sides both sides will will hurt will be hurt from that process okay that's clear with this uh, strong message we will close the session of ab uh, InBev. and i would like to thank you uh, omer and avi for paying it forward for sharing all your uh, insights uh, and thank you very much guys for doing this thank you very much robin hopefully thank next you. time we'll be in person yeah that yeah. will be that we like. It was wonderful. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, let's move to the uh, second uh, webinar of uh, today. Uh, for our second uh, session, we present the Antwerp Management uh, School view 
uh, on corporate uh, venturing based on years of uh, research that we've done together with uh, PwC. And one of our experts in uh, corporate innovation and corporate uh, venturing is here for you today. It's Andries Reimer, who is in the lead of this uh, research and is going to tell you all about this. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. Happy to com contribute to this uh, interesting webinar. Uh, welcome from my side. So as Robin mentioned, I'm going to present some uh, results of uh, our study that we've been doing for several years now together with our partner, uh, PwC. Um, I'm also happy that today I can announce that the second uh, white paper that we uh, wrote is just today going to be launched. So you will be able to download and see some excer excerpts from it uh, in, in a sneak preview. So um, yeah, together with my colleague, Professor uh, Vincent Molly, we are doing this research. And we're doing it in several phases. So what we are doing so far is uh, we interviewed more than 100 uh, companies uh, active in uh, corporate venturing, startups, corporates, but also the stakeholders around it. So the incubators, the government, and uh, all the stakeholders. We tried to capture all those views together into to com complete the holistic view of corporate venturing. Um, now, what is the first thing that we, we saw? Um, uh, when we um, um, did this research, so first of all, uh, maybe one thing extra. So the, the, what, what we did beside the interviews was uh, the, the Corporate Venturing Barometer. Uh, it's an online survey that we launched, uh, we launch every year, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, for the 2019 Barometer, we had 608 responses, so it was quite a lot of uh, uh, responses. Um, and based on this data that, that we gathered there together with the uh, interviews and the cases that we discussed, uh, we combined our, our insights. One of the first things we, we did in this research is uh, to go and see like, what, what do we, exp what do we uh, mean with corporate venturing? Uh, in the previous webinar, um, we saw a, a, an acquisition, and this is uh, together with corporate venturing capital, always been the main focus of corporate venturing. What we see, uh, if we dig deeper into the literature and the different models that were online uh, or were published, um, we actually uh, broaden up our scope of corporate venturing. So how we define corporate venturing is more a collaborative um, of, of a corporate startup cooperation uh, it goes way beyond uh, capital and, uh, and acquisitions. And in our view, um, it already starts with going to, net to network events where you can mingle as a startup with corporates and vice versa. Um, so as you can see here on the slide, we have 20 different uh, ways to collaborate between corporates and startups. And as you can see, there is this uh, commitment that uh, rises from the, the first one attending networks up to the, the number 20, that is the acquisition. So the commitment between the two parties is uh, virtual nothing at one, and it's really, really high, meaning like you're, you're acquired, so you, you're uh, married, let's say. So that's uh, the, the ultimate goal. That's the only uh, flow that we see in this uh, 20 forms. So there is no... Um, connection or uh, no uh, order, let's say. You don't have to go from one to two, from two to three, etc. cetera. Um, you can do multiple uh, different forms at once. Um, so there, that's the only thing that we see here is that the commitment is rising from one to 20. Um, that being said, what we added to this is some uh, bridges because what we saw in the beginning uh, interviewing uh, startups and, and also incubators and accelerator programs, um, we saw that uh, where a lot of companies struggle with um, is the confidentiality and the IP uh, rulings. Uh, often we saw that when, when uh, startups uh, want to participate in a hackathon or want to just talk about their ID with, uh, with corporates, the corporates and the, and the startups already start uh, being afraid, let's call it, 
about that uh, the other party will steal their their IDs or steal their contacts or uh, so so the IP and the, the confidentiality that you actually um, need in this collaboration was already from the beginning a burden where startups want to go fast uh, and want to start running where the corporates want to hold on and make sure that everything is safe and their their trade secrets and their uh, their strengths are protected uh, and if you talk to lawyers they will say from the beginning uh, you need to have uh, an NDA and an IP uh, uh, contracts in place but that's not working for the, the other side so what we did is we built in some uh, bridges and they are uh, just um, as an indication from what type of collaboration you should be thinking of what type of uh, IP rulings. So for example, if you uh, switch to from number four to number five, so if you start with startup challenges and awards, then it makes sense to actually start thinking about confidentiality. Um, if you go uh, co-develop a project, a uh, corporate startup co-development, then you can actually start negotiating on IP. So this is a guideline on when to do uh, what type of confidentiality and what type of uh, contract you need to discuss. Um, another thing we, we saw in our research is that um, the, the ways so these are the forms, the different forms you can actually collaborate. Uh, and in the first um, white paper we launched, we actually focused on the why. Why should you do corporate venturing? And um, so we explored five broad types um, of corporate venturing and, and the different elements of corporations. But we noticed every time again that actually the strategic importance uh, should always trump the financial ones. So if your goal is to have financial uh, success on, on the short term, then uh, corporate venturing should not be your um, way to go. So it should always be a, a strategic choice and a strategic uh, um, collaboration between corporates and startups. And I think we saw that really well in the previous presentation of ABI, where um, the corporate actually identifies the, the actual problems that are in the business and tries to uh, find solutions on the market to solve those problems of the corporate. And then we're talking about the strategic uh, collaboration. Um, so, okay, so uh, what are the, in the, in the first white paper also, this, these are the, the, so what we did was we combined or we tracked the different forms, the 20 forms with different motives. So what were the, the uh, motives for, for corporates and startups to engage in a different form of collaboration? And what we uh, learned from this is that uh, indeed financial ones, were, where the, the, the success was high, that's the, 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 the important element there, so where there is high success rate, ratio, non-financial elements were there. So the number, the top three of, uh, of uh, successful collaborations is gaining knowledge and competences, exploring new products and markets, and getting access to new technologies. So that are the top three of collaboration uh, forms that were, uh, or motives, let's say. Uh, so that were the top three motives which, which were successful. Uh, as a collaboration between uh, corporates and startups. So what else that we, that we see here is that there are uh, different, always different goals and expectations or what the main problems that we saw in these collaborations is that there are differences in goals and, and, collaborate and, and, and culture and added value. And uh, so as a corporate or a startup and you want to start uh, a collaboration it is really important to really discuss these elements so what are your short term goals what are the long term goals how do you fit your uh, the culture of the the small or agile uh, can do company a startup that wants to start running starts uh, going ahead and uh, a, a corporates which often has a really different culture of maintaining and, and a stable process. What is the added value that you're gonna give 
to the corporates, what is the added value that you're gonna get from the corporate and vice versa. And of course, the legal parts, like what are the contracts that you need to have in place. Often uh, what we see is that the legal part and the shareholder part and, and the money part is getting way more attention than the, the goals and the added value part. And this is where, um, this is the seed of, of, of uh, failed co collaborations because the legal part is important indeed, but it should be not in, more important than the goals and the culture and the added value. So these four elements should be um, at least have the same amount of, of attention. You can have a beautiful contract uh, and a beautiful shareholder uh, contract in place, but if your goals are not aligned and your culture is not aligned, it's not going to happen or the, the collaboration will fail. So it's really important uh, to pay attention on the four elements of these, these collaborations. Now, if we look into the research and we're gonna look into what are the um, main motives for uh, corporations, we already touched upon that, uh, gaining knowledge and competences, exploring new products and markets. But if we look into the motives for these uh, startups, they are really, really different. So it shows that, uh, so for them, it's getting access to the market. And so if we go back to the, the added value uh, that, that this company and, the, co and the, the, the corporate and the startup are looking, they're different. So they have to be aligned. So there, there should be an agreement on, and they should be on the same line, that actually the startup can actually get this access to the market that they are looking for, and the corporate is actually gaining the knowledge and the competences that they're looking for. And they should actually fit into each other really nicely. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Another element that we saw uh, in our research, like what are the, the most important challenges for corporates? It was very difficult to select the right start for a company. Uh, it was very difficult to fit these activities and its time investment into the daily operations of our companies. So there are main challenges for the corporates. They don't know which startup is right for them and they cannot fit it in the uh, main activities. And I do believe that the presentation that we got from uh, ABI and the way they approach it is really interesting uh, uh, example. Because instead of um, needing or having the need to pick one startup from the start and not then you are actually in the, in in an option paralysis because which uh, startup is the right one? The a way to go forward is to have a variety of startups and do a lot, small pilot and a, in an MVP way test all these startups and then if you have more data uh, to select or to choose on based on that data and do those tests then actually select them. So postponing the decision and actually making this decision on actual data and tests and results of the POC can help in this um, selection. If we look to the most important challenges that startups actually saw was that the decision making in the company of the startup and the corporate were very different. So that's again, uh, the, what we saw often is that the culture uh, is really different where the culture in a, in a, in a, in a corporate in the corporate is really hierarchical most of the times it has uh, multiple people have their say about it in a startup it's just we will do it. yes right let's go so there there are really different uh, ways of, of making decisions and and going forward so as a startup you have to understand this but also as a corporate you need to understand that in the startup it's different so the understanding between the two parties should be uh, can be higher often and what we noticed in the, the different uh, cases that we studied in depth is that um, these differences in culture can also be uh, overwhelmed by a personal connection so where a small startup has to talk to a bigger corporation if the personal collection, connection between the startup CEO and a representative of the corporate is on par and they are talking and matching uh, uh, people to people, uh, person to person, human to human, then uh, this can overcome actually the, the difference in size between uh, corporate and startup. Um, so to continue, 
we dive a little bit deeper in the, the different ways to collaborate. So these are the 20 forms of collaboration again, but they're grouped in the five different types, as we call it. So uh, when we, we uh, did the analysis of these results, we didn't we did not only check for the for uh, relevant uh, insights on the different twenty different types, but also clustered them in different um, yes, uh, um, yeah, groups of uh, collaboration. And here are also some interesting findings that we can share with you. So, uh, for example the impact of corporate venturing on the success of your uh, corporate. So this, these uh, impacts or these results are only for corporates. Um, so if you're um, looking for gaining knowledge and competences, what the majority of corporates that do corporate venturing are, then from our research, uh, it is shown that you best engage in corporate venturing from type four. So if you go back one slide, you see Type four is the corporate incubator, accelerator, corporate accelerator, and the startup studio. So if you're, you're, uh, you want to gain knowledge and competence, then it's best to engage in corporate venturing of type four. That's the, the, from our research, it says that it has the highest chance on success. Um, another element that you can do to increase the success in this area is that you do uh, more than one form of corporate venturing. So if you have a higher intensity of corporate venturing, then the chances on, of success will be higher. Especially incubation acceleration programs are success factors for this uh, motive. If we look to exploring new products and new markets, then the research says that we are must, must focus on uh, type number three. So for uh, type number three, it's co-development of a project, strategic partnerships, and licensing. So if you want to, as a corporate, explore new markets and new products, then it's best to co-develop a product or a service with a, a, a startup, uh, um, engage in st uh, strategic partnerships, or do some licensing. Uh, again, if the corporate is active in more than one uh, form of corporate venturing. This in announces the success um, for this uh, goal. Continuing. <clears throat> if you want, if your goal is to develop an ecosystem, again, type number four will be your way to go. Um, what we also see is that this is significantly better if you are, are a bigger corporation. So smaller SMEs or so, uh, like smaller organizations do not necessarily benefit from this. Again, if you are active in more than one corporate venture and form, you will have a higher position, strong position on developing of an ecosystem. Um, and what we also saw is that corporates that have less issues with the, the, the incorporation of the corporate venture activities in the regular, regular activities, they score better on this. So it means if you have a dedicated uh, FTEs or a dedicated team that is working on corporate venturing, uh, apart from the day-to-day -day operations, then you score better on uh, developing of an ecosystem. Specific uh, forms of collaboration are co-development, uh, own incubation program, uh, uh, accelerator program, sorry, with other companies, and an own accelerator program. What we also did, besides looking for uh, singular uh, types of uh, corporate venturing, we also started looking to different combination of types. Um, so an interesting one was if your goal is to achieve financial benefits, what we already said um, was not the, the, the best thing to do. But if that's your goal, from the research, we learned that type number four and type number five, so the incubation acceleration uh, ways and the acquihire, uh, joint venture, limited capital and acquisition, those types combined should be the best uh, bet for ach achieving uh, financial benefits. 
if you are looking to transform your company, uh, so you want to bring more innovation in your company, there are two options. Uh, we always see that type four is involved. So the, the corporate incubator, the corporate accelerator programs, those are always in, involved, but it, it's only successful if they are uh, in combination with type number two, so, so the hackathons and mentoring, venture clients, and uh, number three, so the co-development and strategic alliances. And then increasing brand awareness, what which is uh, often for smaller companies, uh, so SMEs and smaller organizations, um, a, a big plus of this type of collaborations. We see that always the first one, type one, uh, network events, sponsoring and scouting missions in combination with incubation, acceleration, and uh, capital. So those are the best uh, ways to achieve uh, these motives in brand awareness, in transformation and financial benefits. And they only are active or they only are true if you combine different types of uh, corporate venturing. So if you want to know more, you can download our brand new, it's just going to be launched later today. So you are the first one that can actually download this uh, white paper. You can just scan the code and it will lead you to the download page. Uh, this one is the white paper number two, which handles the success factors of corporate startup collaborations. The number one, white paper number one, you can also download on this site. And it goes on the why and how of corporate venturing. And if you are want, if you do want to help out on the next of the research, you can actually uh, fill out the the survey, which is an extensive one. And it has to be said like twenty plus minutes on uh, collab corporate venturing in Belgium, and it will help us uh, build uh, more data and a new re report for twenty twenty. So this was my part of the story. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer some questions from you now. Okay, thank you very much, Andris. That was very clear and very interesting uh, research. Um, any questions now that we can take? So you can always uh, post your questions in the uh, public uh, chat, and then we'll have uh, a look at your uh, questions. Maybe I will uh, open the uh, Q&A uh, session then with a question from my side. Um, so, uh, Andres, you, you did this research uh, together with uh, PWC. Um, what's next in the in the pipeline after this uh, research? What are the next steps uh, after uh, you've done uh, this research? So, uh, in the research itself, we are testing some tools um we're doing a small uh experiment with uh, uh smaller smes to get them engaged in corporate venturing so we are doing we're testing some tools uh, uh our cv readiness scan and some tools to actually incorporate uh corporate venturing in your uh operations that's for this uh, research project next to that i'm working on a phd uh on open innovation and we are uh, looking into uh, other collaborations with other bigger uh, players on the actual um, corporate innovation part of the, the story. So what we see in this research is that uh, corporate venturing itself is an interesting addition to a broader innovation perspective and a broader innovation strategy. So um, next to the uh, corporate venturing and open innovation, we are looking, uh, we're going to start researching the uh, corporate innovation part because they have to uh, be aligned, otherwise it won't work. Katarina has a, a question. Uh, just to clarify, which of the options would be a pilot co-development project? Question mark. Well, so let me go back to, I don't know which slide it is by heart. It should be there somewhere. So um, there could be some pilots. Um, so co-development project could be a pilot, but most of the times the venture client is a pilot um, where the, the corporate actually buys 
the service, the early services of a, uh, as a startup. All, or it might be that um, there's one case that we studied is that uh, the startup had developed a solution that they thought was very valuable for a company. They went to this company and the company said, it is kind of interesting, but not so much. So let's uh, re, re recode and rework this solution. And then it, uh, it might be valuable for us. And then we are indeed in a co-development uh, project. So number eight and nine are uh, uh, considered a pilot, pilot phase. There's a, a question from Machas. What is the balance between uh, corporate venturing, uh, approaching uh, startups for acquisition and vice versa? Do most acquisition come from startups pitching to uh, corporate ventures or through proactive scouting by corporate ventures? Well, I think uh, it's also been said earlier today in the, in the webinar and a talk from uh, Avi, the the or maybe it was yesterday i forgot but the the power uh shifted from corporates to uh, startups basically because what we see is that a lot of talented people today are no longer willing to um, just go and work for corporates so if they have their the bright uh, young people they often start their own startup um uh, a joke goes around that says uh, that uh, the war on talent is over, talent has won, because they can do whatever they want if they start their own startup. And so um, it used to be that corporates went on hunting uh, for startups and they just acquired them. And nowadays, I, I have the feeling, but it's not being backed by data for uh, just to, to be clear. Um, so, but what we see uh, it, when talking with the, the actors in the field is that it's shifting. So more and more startups are aware of their potential. Uh, they are being guided very well with, within uh, accelerator programs, incubation programs. So they know their value. Um, and they are, when they are run well, they're in a strong position. Uh, nevertheless, they still need uh, or can use the corporate structures and the corporate markets and the corporate uh, uh, reach that they, the bigger corporate corporates have. So, and then I touch back on what uh, Omer uh, said: like, um, if if you are a startup and you want to scale and you have to do it on your on your own, it's gonna take it's gonna take way longer than if you just can collaborate with already a partner that has a distribution network all over the world. So when there's this win-win, I think the two parties can meet. Who is the earliest one to uh, make the bridge and start communicating? It's re it really differs on the problem. Like if you have an, uh, a, a corporate that is really well organized as AB InBev and is really scouting and, and uh, trying to solve uh, problems, it might be that they find the startup earlier. Um, it could be that the startup already f found you first because they thought it was interesting to collaborate. Um, one thing to add there, and then I'm going to close up this question, but one thing that's important, if you are a corporate and you want to connect to startups, it's very important that you have a, a, a direct line on your website. Uh, so to, towards the responsibles of these innovations, because often these startups, and this is also a case that we studied, um, a startup really wants to connect to a uh, innovative company in Belgium, and they are known for their corporate venture activities, but they just cannot reach the, the, the responsible. So they try to LinkedIn, they try to send emails, but they don't have the direct uh, access. So what they, the only option they have is to send an, an, an email to the info address, and then where does it end up? So if you're, uh, as a corporate, if you're open to collaborations, make sure there is a gateway on your website that uh, has a straight uh, linkage to the responsible. So ev every uh, attempt of connection is actually uh, funneled through to the right persons. Okay, that's clear. We have another question from uh, Mathieu. Is there a big difference in efforts going clockwise or counterclockwise on the commitment? So he's referring to the um, uh, figure that is in front of uh, us. 
So is there a big difference in efforts going clockwise or counterclockwise on the commitment? don't understand the question i think fully but um so the commitment means that that um, you are more entangled in the in the collaboration so for example if if you are a joint venture uh it will be uh way more difficult to to separate again um if you are just organizing a hackathon it can ask a lot of effort to organize it but the commitment between the two parties will be only temporary just for the the duration of the hackathon um then if we talk about efforts like the equity hire the acquisition the effort there if you have to do a due diligence uh, the, the contract etc it's also a lot of effort so the 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 forms the are not really linked to the effort that is needed um depending on what how how broad you take the scope because for example if you take number three which is a scouting mission the effort for the uh, the corporate itself is just signing up and go there but the effort to organize the scouting mission and to organize the trip and the visits etc there's also a lot of effort in but for the, the corporate itself um it's it's less effort the um, the, the lower ones but it's not a direct line together with the commitment. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question from Katarina. Uh, how would you rate the success of pilots in general? I assume that startups don't actually make money. At best, it might be covering costs. So from what you have seen from the perspective of a startup, what is crucial for it to make the pilot a success? Um, I'm not sure whether we really looked into that in detail, but what are your thoughts on that, uh, Andris? It really depends, and I, I, I touch back upon the, the talk of earlier today. I think um, Avi and Omer had, had some really good things to say about that. Um, one thing for sure that we know from our research is that um, if you want to do a pilot, um, as a startup yourself also, you must be aware of your strategy and your value. So um, what AB said is, as a, as a startup, you must be aware of your, of your phase. Uh, are you able to uh, commit to the, the, uh, the obligations or the, the, the ask the questions you will be asked from the corporate by uh, linking with them? So knowing yourself as a startup and the strength and this uh and the added value uh for the start is crucial and that should be number one then your strategy like is it you want to scale fast and go international or you want to do some extra tests and and have a beach market somewhere that is really solid and then from there on scale so what is the goal of this collaboration you have to you have to know and think about that really yourself and then it's only going to uh, a possible possible party, uh, a, co a corporate party, to uh, establish a pilot from. But if you, as a startup, don't do your homework and you don't know what you want to learn from the pilot and what is your strategy uh, that you want to achieve with this pilot, then already it's a, a recipe for, for failure. So that should be number one for a startup. And that's what we see often going wrong. Startups just want to scale as, as quickly as possible because they think if we are big enough, we can make a huge exit. Um, but uh, it, it's not always this case because if you scale too fast, you can, you can grow yourself to death. Um, and if you burn yourself with a, a company and you're doing a pilot and you uh, promised him the world and you cannot deliver because... Uh, you're too young or your uh, process aren't uh, on par, then um, you can burn yourself. And if you then want to collaborate with another corporate to actually test a second one, it will be a lot harder because corporates talk to each other as well. So I would say uh, for a successful pilot, make sure that as a startup you do your homework and then with your uh, your clear goals, and expectations go in a discussion with the corporate and only do the pilot if this is aligned otherwise just find another party and it's hard to step away from a bad deal but if 
you step into a bad deal, you're, um, excuse my French, fucked anyway. Okay. Um, maybe a follow up uh, question on that. I wonder as, well, we're in the startup uh, perspective now, uh, if it is, is it a good uh, growth strategy to um, go to a corporate and to work together with a corporate, knowing that you have a bit of exclusivity with that corporate and you might not uh, be able to work with other corporates out there when you commit to one of them? Uh, is that a good growth strategy for a startup company or uh, are there other better roads to go or is there a better timing to do this? I, I will take my, my researcher card here. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, it really depends. If, if, you're, um, if you have the opportunity to work, for example, like uh, the, the example earlier today with one of the biggest brewers in the world, uh, which gives you so much leverage that you can actually be a world player immediately, it might, may, might make sense to actually uh, take that shot. Um, on the other hand, it could be that, for example, uh, the example of Bao Living, uh, an MIE uh, alumni uh, who is working with, for example, Avain Rui, it's a building construction company. Um, they agreed that they will not have any exclusivity. They can use uh, the, the, and, and make use of the network and facilities of Avain Rui, but Avain Rui explicitly encourages them to go broader than that. But obviously, competitors of Van Rooy will, will think twice when working with um, Bao because they are, uh, Van Rooy has invested in them. So it's a sword that cuts in two, uh, on two sides. And it's a really a, an, um, a good uh, bit of thinking that you need to do before uh, engaging in, in this type of, of um, collaborations. Um, another case that we studied in depth is the, the case of Da Vinci Lab, and they are acquired by Proximus, a, a big mobile players in Belgium. But one of the best clients that they had was Telenet, uh, the big competitor of Proximus. And Proximus said, you can continue working with Telenet. We don't mind. We want you to grow as big as possible. Uh, so they tell, told Avenci Labs that they could work, uh, still continue working with the Tailnet. They, they are free to operate. They are a, a separate entity. Uh, but at a certain point, Tailnet itself uh, terminated the, the contract because they didn't want to work with uh, a subsidiary of, of their competitor. They couldn't uh, um, do that anymore. So there's always a, a downside uh, somewhere. And, but there, there are the choices that you need to make. As an entrepreneur, you also have to make choices about features. Which feature are going to, you going to develop first? And these are also these uh, decisions that you need to take uh, and think thoroughly through because it can make or break your uh, startup. I don't know if that answered your question, Robin, but... <laughs> no, that's, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, any ideas on... Uh, that's a question from Katerina. Any ideas on how the coronavirus and COVID-19 affects these type of uh, corporate venturing? Which ones can you see being eliminated? And can you think of a new way of corporate venturing? It's of course not part of the research and it's something which has uh, popped up the last couple of uh, months. So it's not easy to already see effects on corporate venturing, on business for sure, but on corporate venturing. But uh, anyhow, um, this is a question from Katarina. Yeah, I think it's, it's an interesting question because things are shifting. Um, I don't think that a lot of new ways of new forms of collaboration um, will be incorporated in any time soon because I think that the, the model that we built here is really, really broad and captures a lot. But what I do see, and uh, we heard it earlier in the growth strategy tour, that uh, that a lot of corporates sit on their cash. Uh, they want to hold out during the, the pandemic situation and they don't know what's coming, so they hold on their cash. So what you could expect is that uh, the type number five where cash is involved or, or more cash is involved, 
uh, the, the venture capital and the funds and the acquire and acquisition, that those will be less popular, would, I would say. Um, but the, it cannot be said by the research. It's just my gut feeling. Um, but it's an interesting uh, way of looking at it because often when co uh, startups come to me and they want to collaborate with uh, corporates, they often think straight away on this type number five. So they think we have to give away shares. They think we have to uh, um, sell ourselves out, etc. What we try to do in this research and with the com uh, communication about this research is, is to um, tell startups and, and explain to startups and corporates that there are multiple ways of collaborating where no, uh, yeah, not a lot of money is involved and no uh, strict ties are involved neither. So you can just, what we always say, it's, bet, um, it's like a good marriage. You don't, marry, you don't go marrying straight away. You first uh, chat and then you start dating and then maybe you start living together and then only you marry. And this is the way that we see corporate venturing. Uh, it's a, a process where you get to know each other, where you get confident in it, uh, you get confidence in each other's, and and maybe this COVID situation can um, um, help to prolong this process that you don't go too fast to the marriage, uh, but that you live longer together and get to know each other better, and then have a better deal for both parties at the end. But this is just my guess. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Andries. Uh, maybe a final question, and then we close this part of the, the, the webinar. So Lawrence has a question. Could you compare Belgium to New York, Tel Aviv, for other well-known ecosystems in terms of corporate venturing and the business culture mindset that goes along with it? Um, yeah, good question. Um, so the research that we did was uh, only focused on Belgium. So the, the responses that we have in that from the thing that we presented here is just Belgium. Um, I think you, you already saw in the last few days that uh, Belgium and, and New York and Tel Aviv have uh, slightly different cultures. And so um, I can assume that there is a big difference in how a corporates engage in collaborations. Um, I don't think many different forms will be used. So I think this model of the 20 forms will be relatively complete. But the way uh, how, um, for example, AB InBev actually is working, what we just learned is really uh, interesting in, in scouting missions and then uh, pilots and then going further, and then when, when they see the value and they actually validated the value, then they go to acquiring the company. So this is actually the, the, the way that we think is best to do it. Um, in my opinion, in Belgium, there is still a lot of education needed, maybe, and, and but I can't say for sure, but I have the feeling that the Tel Aviv and New York ecosystems are more mature in the, the way of collaborating and they have this way of working and testing and doing several forms of, collab uh, of collaboration uh, simultaneously. They have that more in their DNA already than uh, in the Belgian ecosystem. Okay, thank you, Andries. Thank maybe you. To, maybe to add one more thing, what, what, okay. what uh, is an advantage of Belgium is that we have a lot of SMEs uh, working here. And for startups, uh, working with an SME can be of great value in that sense that um, uh, SMEs are often run by entrepreneurs themselves, whether corporates are, are run uh, by managers that need to uh, tick some boxes at the end of the year to get their bonus. So the, a big advantage for startups working with uh, SMEs uh, is that you are talking entrepreneur to entrepreneur and that there is uh, often a, a big, a good understanding uh, between the two entrepreneurs, like what do we need and on what phase are they now? So that is the big advantage of Belgium, that uh, the economy is for 80% uh, SMEs, smaller and bigger SMEs. So there Belgium has can have an advantage if uh, those SMEs start knowing and, and, and uh, figuring out the ways to collaborate. So that's what we're working on for. Okay, that's a strong message to end uh, the second part of the uh, 
seminar. So thank you very much, uh, Andris, for sharing all these uh, research insights. And we're looking forward to the report that is will be published uh, this uh, afternoon, if I'm uh, correct. Thank you. Let's come back to for the third uh, webinar of today. Uh, so we had the ABI, ABMF uh, uh, perspective on uh, corporate innovation and corporate venturing. We had uh, Antwerp Management School's uh, research together with PwC uh, of the last couple of years in, uh, in Belgium. And now we return back to Tel Aviv uh, to uh, hopefully uh, good weather also there. Um, and we are there to listen to the perspective of uh, Microsoft. Uh, and we are very uh, honored to have uh, Ras Barghar here with us, the Managing Director of Microsoft for Startups. So Ras, the floor is yours. Perfect, thank you so much uh, for having me. And uh, I'll try to make it uh, uh, as uh, fast and efficient as possible on my end. Um, we do have a couple of slides to go through, but uh, hopefully you will find uh, everything uh, uh, relative and uh, interesting. A quick intro about myself. Uh, I've been with uh, Microsoft for the last uh, 13 months or so. Uh, in the last uh, 13 months, I've been with, uh, uh, I've been led, uh, I've been leading the Microsoft for startup team in Israel. We have an uh, overall responsibility across the ecosystem, the um, a relationship with the investors, accelerators, communities, uh, working with uh, founders and startups from uh, early stage, even from um, like you know, students that are starting their first uh, uh, company to uh, unicorns that uh, are running around in uh, Israel. Uh, before uh, Microsoft, I spent seven years with uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, actually based in Luxembourg. So uh, I know uh, the Netherlands quite well. And uh, there I led the uh, startup business development team and managed that operation across uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa, which gave me a super interesting perspective on seeing and benchmarking different ecosystem and see them grow along the years. Uh, I'll try also to leave as much time as possible to questions uh, in the end. Uh, if you have any questions, I can also try to uh, like you know, read the chat in parallel. So. Uh, what I thought about doing is like to give you a quick introduction about uh, Microsoft and then diving a little bit deeper uh, on the things that we're doing related to startups in Israel. So quick introduction about uh, what Microsoft is doing in Israel. Uh, we've been present over here since 1991. Uh, we have more than, I think the number now is already 1,600 uh, engineers operating in uh, Israel uh, across uh, almost 30 different product teams. Right, so uh, while a lot of them are around uh, cybersecurity, there are also products like uh, computer vision, healthcare, um, uh, hardware, Xbox, uh, uh, Excel, right, like those kind of products that are also being developed uh, from Israel. Uh, you can see here some of the locations uh, that we have. So, you know, we are spread across, uh, across the country uh, in five locations at the moment. Now, uh, I'm not sure how many of you uh, uh, know or have been in uh, Israel, but Israel is relatively a small country. Uh, on a single uh, tank of gas, you can actually go from one side of the country to the other. Now, uh, in spite of that fact, Israel actually uh, is quite a significant uh, a position uh, when it comes to the um, a global stage of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And you can see some of the numbers uh, that we have uh, over here on the slide. Uh, again, everybody in Israel are either working in something related to startups or have like a one degree separation to somebody that is uh, uh, related to either startups or investment, right? So it's an extremely small and dense uh, ecosystem. Now, uh, just kind of to give you the, the like the numbers behind it, like we have more than 300 uh, VCs that are uh, based in Israel. So, uh, take into account the uh, funding amounts that uh, that we have. Uh, roughly half of the money is being invested by uh, Israeli VCs, but then additional 50% uh, of the money is being injected to the country from foreign funds. Right, uh, uh, lots of that obviously coming from. Uh, uh, the US and, uh, and the EU, but then also from uh, China, for example. 
you can see here the maturity of the uh, ecosystem along the years and uh, I mean, it's been quite a significant amount with regards to uh, either the number of uh, uh, startups that are being formed or the amount of capital that is being injected into the uh, ecosystem. Uh, today, we have roughly, um, I believe the number is around 7,000 startups, right, which is quite significant. And you can see, again, some of the... Um, a more well-known uh, either funding announcement or uh, exit that we had in the last couple of years. Uh, I'm not sure if um, uh, people here had a chance to uh, to hear, but I think last, no, this week actually, uh, Intel also acquired a, another company in Israel. So interestingly enough, uh, Mobileye, uh, the company that you can see here on the left, uh, which is uh, doing um, a hardware and software for autonomous driving, uh, actually acquired through the Mobileye subsidiary uh, a company called uh, Movit. Uh, I know it's quite popular in uh, uh, the Netherlands as well, uh, for $1 billion, right? So again, it's another uh, kind of um, uh, recognition to the ecosystem and the maturity stage. Um, uh, there is a specific uh, slide around that, uh, use case in particular. Now, uh, the not so secret uh, uh, ingredient of the Israeli uh, innovation, obviously coming from the from the army. So the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, uh, have a huge investment on the, uh, investing in soldiers that are uh, tracked uh, during their high school years, right? So we go to the Army, it's a mandatory service. So we go to the army after high school and uh, almost everybody that qualifies for uh, having a role that relates to uh, tech, whether it be, um, you know, or engineering in general, uh, can probably be tracked and be recruited to one of the technology units. Uh, A200 internal unit is the most uh, well-known one. Uh, some of the graduates uh, set up companies like uh, Palo Alto Networks or uh, Checkpoint and uh, those kind of uh, uh, large-scale uh, cybersecurity companies. But then there's also like a lot of other units that uh, are less known, right? Anything from the uh, Air Force and Navy and the uh, other intelligence units, right, that are also extremely uh, active and have uh, interesting uh, tech solutions. The other ingredients that uh, also people uh, tend to uh, uh, forget is like the uh, education system in uh, Israel. There's actually quite a, a good uh, high, level, uh, how to say, like the um, uh, advanced uh, uh, academy system over here. Uh, university education is quite accessible, and uh, Israel actually have like I think. 12 or 13 even recently uh, Nobel Prize uh, winners that again taking that metric of um, uh, Nobel winners per capita is considered to be like one of the highest one if not the highest one in the world. And uh, all of that uh, make makes Israel extremely attractive for multinational corporates to set up shop in Israel, right? So Microsoft obviously was one of the early ones in 1991, but you can see some of the logos uh, on this slide uh, uh, from uh, Intel, Google, Facebook uh, to you know Huawei, Samsung. Uh, there are so many international companies that uh, uh, many times their first uh, location that they open outside of their uh, home country uh, it would be Israel, right? So I can think of uh, Salesforce and uh, Facebook, you know, as an example of um, you know, large scale uh, tech giants that uh, the first location that they opened outside of the US was in Israel. Now, uh, where is it that Israeli uh, innovation actually come into play? So, you know, obviously cybersecurity, uh, I mentioned, you know, some of the uh, names before, you can see it over here. Uh, there's a huge investment, probably 20% of the investment in cybersecurity uh, worldwide goes into Israeli companies. And uh, it continues to be the leading vertical and segment that, uh, uh, that we have. Uh, another acquisition that we had, uh, uh, only this week is a company called uh, CyberX, which is doing um, a cyber security for uh, IoT devices, which uh, uh, just happened to be acquired by Microsoft over here. 
And uh, again, you can see over here how uh, dense the, the ecosystem and the solutions that we have on that, uh, uh, on that vertical. Uh, next one, which is also very interesting, is around the uh, automotive. Uh, there are many uh, discussions, uh, you know, even locally, but then also on the international stage, uh, kind of challenging the positioning of Israel being a startup nation, right? So the startup nation term was coined probably uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, right now, there's like, to, to some extent, like we over exceeded our expectation and now that term of a startup nation uh, positioning the Israeli uh, ecosystem as one that cannot grow large scale companies, right? So the mentality, uh, the, the perceived mentality is that an Israeli entrepreneur is one that will only uh, launch a company, they will scale it and they will sell it by, you know, let's say 10, 50, 100 million dollars and then that's it, right? So, uh, and while it can be an extremely efficient uh, uh, model, uh, it doesn't, there's so much uh, more potential to it if they will, if they will be able to uh, grow large-scale companies uh, in Israel, you know, from employment and um, a benefit to the to the country, and a great example for that is uh, is Wix. Uh, if people know, uh, so that's also like another Israeli company that started as a startup, but today they have more than two thousand employees in uh, in Israel. Now, uh, focusing back on the automotive uh, slide that we have in front of us, uh, again, kind of uh, unchain ourselves from uh, past uh, stigma and looking forward to uh, what are the next hot. Um, uh, verticals that Israel is Israel is uh, well positioned to um, uh, to lead. Uh, automotive is definitely one of them, and you can see on the um, uh, bottom left some of the startups that uh, uh, we have in Israel. Right, so I mentioned Mobileye, uh, Via, Get Taxi, uh, Waze, which was acquired by Google, uh, Juno, also acquired by uh, Uber a couple of um, uh, like two years ago, and. Uh, Move it is the company that I uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago, which was just acquired by um, uh, Mobileye and uh, Intel. Uh, interestingly enough, the uh, speculations are that uh, Intel strategy with Move it would be to so Move it to if you don't know they have like a, a shared a, like an application for a, a shared public uh, transportation so you can basically you know track uh, buses or trains uh, and you know choose the most uh, ideal route uh, taking into account that they now have a, like that Intel now have Mobile which is the hardware and the science of how to um, uh, operate an autonomous car. Now with Move It, they now have the data of how to uh, uh, move it within the municipalities within the city, right? So with the Move It acquisition, they're actually uh, uh, acquiring all of the uh, in-city knowledge, all of the partnerships that uh, Move It actually have with regards to the um, let's say, you know, bus companies and train companies and so on. And then obviously, you know, all of the users, which uh, move it, I think the last number is around 700 million users uh, that they have uh, around the world. Uh, so yeah, I mentioned this one before. Um, and again, like uh, another kind of uh, uh, a uh, stage that we're uh, obviously heavily investing in is uh, around artificial intelligence. It's uh, quite a well-known uh, term and a buzzword, but uh, we definitely see, uh, you know, how dense uh, the ecosystem became with, uh, let's say, companies that are doing uh, through AI and not necessarily companies that are leveraging AI, right? So Autonomous Car is a company that can leverage artificial intelligence for their use case. But in Israel, we have uh, many um, uh, solutions that support the AI use case, right? So it would be anything from uh, automatic solutions to sort your data or to enable researchers to um, uh, optimize their algorithms, right? So that kind of use case to, uh, to manage and to optimize artificial intelligence use cases. Now, uh, the last one that I will touch is around the IoT. And again, over here, I also 
uh, mentioned uh, uh, in earlier slide the acquisition that uh, Microsoft uh, just had uh, this week with regards to uh, CyberX uh, around IoT. Obviously, the um, a 5G is a great enabler for that vertical, and this is also something that uh, Israel is uh, heavily invested in. Um, and the last one, you know, it's uh, around fintech. Uh, again, it's a common uh, use case that we have around the world. And uh, I would say with the more uh, standard uh, vertical that we have, this is probably like the, um, uh, the most well-known one. Now, uh, diving deeper into the uh, interactions that uh, Microsoft uh, have with the ecosystem and how is it that we're deploying uh, uh, our uh, resources over here? How do we drive innovation? How do we keep the relationship with the ecosystem? Um, overall, we have uh, three main activities uh, that we have here on the ground. So uh, M12 is the venture arm of Microsoft, so a CVC. Uh, obviously, you know, they, the, the way that they operate is that they are getting the wish list and the priorities from uh, from the headquarters, so from, from even like the uh, uh, C-level executives on what kind of technologies, what kind of um, uh, insights does Microsoft need to gain, right? So it could be anything from... Uh, uh, you know, we invested in uh, Unbubble, which is a Portuguese uh, translation uh, uh, service, and uh, eventually through that service, uh, we managed to implement their solution across uh, several um, uh, customer service activities that Microsoft have, right? So in those kind of um, priorities that they are trying to, um, uh, to drive. The next one is uh, Microsoft uh, Scale-Up. So the Scale-Up program is a dedicated and exclusive program that uh, uh, Microsoft have, which allow startups to partner with uh, Microsoft. And I'm going to uh, dive on uh, that. I'm just going to double check for a second. Yeah, so uh, the Scale-Up program actually allow uh, startups to partner with Microsoft. So what does it mean in practice? Um, if you know companies like, uh, again, like the ones that I mentioned before, um, uh, even uh, companies like uh, Tableau or uh, Imperva or Checkpoint or uh, uh, all of those kind of large scale uh, Twilio, right? Like those kind of large scale ISVs. Um, because they have such a, a good solution, Microsoft basically want to become the a one-stop shop for enterprises when they want to uh, buy software, right? So uh, if now a uh, ING a bank want to uh, buy uh, uh, software or infrastructure, um, or let's say cloud services, uh, they can actually come to Microsoft. They can choose from the first party offer that Microsoft has, or they can uh, choose from the third party offers that uh, Microsoft have. Uh, examples as I mentioned uh, uh, that I mentioned before. Now, uh, when you think about it, those ISVs are extremely loud scale corporates by themselves, right? So again, like uh, Tableau is a company that's already worth like a couple of billions of dollars. Um, what the scale up program actually allows us is to take startups that are just getting started, and from our perspective, you know, companies that uh, raise the A or B, B round or still at the uh, early stage. And through the scale-up program, we actually give them the same status in the system uh, as those uh, large-scale ISVs. And what it means in practice means that uh, now a Microsoft uh, account management team and Microsoft partners, right? So, you know, think about Accenture in the US, uh, can go and sell and resell, sorry, the startup solution and get compensated for that, right? Now, the thing that uh, um, is continuously, you know, uh, blowing my mind is the fact that, I mean, Microsoft uh, uh, was able to build a program that, you know, in simple words, generate uh, new revenue streams uh, to a startup. Right, and again, from my perspective, uh, when you think about it, you know the uh, main thing that uh, uh, early stage startup actually need is uh, uh, customers, right? And uh, from my perspective, this is the best value proposition that uh, uh, that we can offer.
Uh, I mentioned before again with regards to M12, so you can see we've been very active uh, in the Israeli uh, landscape with over a $1 billion of acquisition, including uh, CyberX, which I mentioned uh, was acquired this week for um, uh, that is doing out the security. Um, ta -ta 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 -ta. And then the last uh, kind of pillar that we have is around the, the reactor. So the reactor is our developer community, uh, very similar to uh, the cloud, right, in uh, in Amsterdam, so or Station F in Paris, if, uh, if people know. So that's basically kind of the investment we have. It's a, a physical space uh, for uh, tech communities to uh, come together, share uh, ideas, uh, work, and, uh, and collaborate. Um, and again, simply because of the positioning that we have uh, in the ecosystem, we actually took it one step further. And uh, sorry, we actually took it one step further, and we are now starting to build communities uh, that are be being driven by Microsoft, but are almost completely agnostic to the to the uh, core services, right? So whether it be uh, the cloud community, the cybersecurity, the um, a DevOps community and so on. We are, because of the positioning, the resources that uh, I kind of laid out, uh, we are partnering up with communities, uh, existing communities, and actually uh, uh, supporting them on you know, promoting that uh, th those kind of uh, topics uh, across the board. Uh, the last pillar, which is the sorry, one of the last uh, kind of. Uh, initiative that we have, which I'm extremely proud of, is a, a new accelerator that we are launching, which is called AI for Good. Uh, the next batch is actually going to start uh, in the upcoming uh, Sunday, so we're super excited about that. Uh, the AI for Good accelerator is a, is a, let's call it like a classic accelerator, uh, which is focusing on three uh, kind of main topics. The first one is uh, to support the startup with their growth and their business. Uh, again, you can imagine content like uh, lean startups, pitching, product market fit, uh, and so on. The second pillar is around um, AI and technology. So obviously, you know, how to leverage the different uh, resources from Microsoft, but then also uh, how to do, um, uh, how to implement like responsible AI. Again, I'm going to elaborate on that uh, a little bit further afterwards, but how to implement uh, responsible AI, AI and ethics, uh, how to avoid bias in your data and those kind of topics. And then the last pillar is around the uh, impact, right? And uh, that would be anything from, you know, how do you do business in emerging countries? How do you make profit in a non-profit world? And uh, those kind of things. And uh, you can see some of the um, topics and focus that uh, we have on the slide. And this is also something that is uh, extremely important uh, for Microsoft is everything that has to do with regards to uh, ethical uh, AI. Uh, we truly believe, again, giving the positioning uh, that we have uh, in the world, uh, we believe that we have a responsib responsibility uh, to ensure AI is being used uh, properly and uh, in a responsible way, right? So I assume that uh, many of you kind of heard around, so I heard uh, this kind of apocalyptic uh, scenarios that uh, uh, about AI. And uh, while, again, uh, a lot of them are, you know, pure speculations uh, or uh, things that are, uh, you know, con a conspiracy theory, uh, in the end, there is room for to put mechanisms uh, to monitor, uh, you know, how AI is being used, uh, ensure, you know, that it's inclusive, ensure that it's secure, that it's private, um, and those kind of things. And uh, Microsoft uh, invests not only in, in our product, but also in the education around uh, ethical uh, use of AI. Uh, that is actually something that is um, uh, driven by uh, Satya uh, directly. Now, uh, again, I assume everybody knows Satya is the CEO of uh, Microsoft, stepped in in uh, 2014 to the role. And, uh, you know, he's been with Microsoft for a really long time. But the incredible thing is that the main um, change that he drove with uh, Microsoft uh, is the culture, 
right? So uh, I'm not sure how many of you were familiar with uh, Microsoft and the culture uh, the days before uh, Satya, but uh, Microsoft in the past was perceived as a, a Olgar IT or software company, right? And um, uh, through the change in uh, internal culture and also the messaging that we have uh, on, you know, on our to our customers on our products, um, uh, you know, he was able to uh, change completely the direction of the company. And uh, one of the things that again for me it was uh, uh, that for me were uh, quite uh, uh, compelling is that when he stepped in, I think after his first year. Um, uh, he changed the mission statement of Microsoft, right? So for a really, really long time, I think from day one that uh, Bill Gates uh, set the mission uh, statement for uh, Microsoft, uh, it was something around uh, uh, enabling every person in the world to uh, access to uh, personal computing or something like that, right? And uh, basically when Satya came, he basically said, um, yeah, I mean, we, we achieved that, right? The uh, personal computing is now accessible everywhere, and uh, uh, that mission statement is no longer relevant. Uh, we should evolve, and uh, this is when he uh, changed the mission statement for uh, Microsoft, which is empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And uh, in order to kind of uh, set some guidelines on that mission statement, uh, he uh, basically set a couple of ground rules, right? So everybody uh, uh, needs to uh, work and to um, uh, uh, have a growth mindset, right? So everything that uh, that we do, we need to make sure that, you know, how can we make our customer uh, scale? How can we uh, uh, um, uh, scale the audience that we work with, right? So the diversity and the inclusion. How can we uh, scale the internal partners and stakeholder circle that we're working with, right? Eventually, we want to drive change, and uh, we want to make sure that um, um, we're kind of scaling the circles as much as possible. Uh, the second thing that he said uh, is around uh, changing, you know, from a company and the culture that uh, uh, was around, you know, I know everything, I know it all. Uh, he changed it to, uh, you know, learn it all. So there's huge amount, uh, relatively, there's a lot of time uh, that is being carved out to every employee uh, in Microsoft uh, to basically invest in their own personal development, uh, whether it be you know from uh, soft skills to um, to hobbies to um, uh, you know uh, uh, certifications and uh, technical capabilities, right? So uh, the organization continuously invests in uh, you know evolving and uh, to grow your mindset. Um, the second thing is around uh, you know a beginner beginner's mind right so everything that we're trying to uh, to do we are always going to uh, look at it from a, um, a from a set of uh, fresh eyes and of course keeping the customer uh, front and center ensuring that you know we're listening as much as possible and we're always open for uh, feedback and uh, iteration on our on our products Uh, the last, the, sorry, the, another thing is around diversity and inclusion, and uh, also here, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, basically carved on our uh, on its flag, uh, the you know to be one of the uh, leading, if not the leading company with regards to diverse uh, and inclusion. It's and that goes anything from uh, you know accessibility in the workplace to ensuring that. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, unbiasedness with regards to uh, hiring or uh, or promotions and those kind of things. Uh, from our perspective, from the Microsoft for Startups uh, point of view, uh, we are uh, doing a lot of work with regards to uh, empower underrepresented founders, and that would be anything from uh, again in Israel that would be the. Uh, Arab community, it would be the uh, Orthodox Jews, uh, it would be uh, uh, female founders, right? So uh, everything around uh, those kind of things, uh, we believe that we have the uh, ability and the responsibility to actually uh, step forward and uh, allowing those uh, communities 
to uh, you know to basically achieve more by giving them the right uh, resources and again this is a few examples to what i mentioned before some activities that we're doing with the uh, uh, women community in israel um uh, the next thing is around uh, you know how can we uh, be like one microsoft right and uh, to give you an example for that uh, if people know it or not but Microsoft actually had a couple of very interesting acquisition in the last uh, a couple of years. Uh, would it be uh, GitHub, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Mojan, the creators of uh, Minecraft, right? So um, in the past, when Microsoft acquired a company uh, or, you know, when teams wanted to collaborate, uh, it was something that was uh, extremely uh, uh, unpopular uh, because, again, there was some sort of a mini competition right between the different teams within different stakeholders between uh, individuals managers and so on uh, again one of the key uh, responsibilities uh, sorry the key um, uh, topics that we have in our mission statement is around like we should always uh, think as one microsoft and uh, uh, we're actually being encouraged to reach out to uh, teams outside of our organization and you know to collaborate with them and to give an example for that, um, we are now running a series of, uh, of events for Israeli founders. Uh, this is being uh, delivered by uh, LinkedIn, right? Uh, around the uh, HR, marketing, uh, recruitment, and so on, right? Which is, again, something that is uh, um, relatively new. And the last thing is around, again, like uh, making a difference and uh, 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 ensuring that we are extremely active on that. And uh, uh, also here, whether it be the uh, AI for good or some of the uh, uh, Microsoft philanthropy activity that, uh, that we're running, uh, we definitely think you know, that we have the moral responsibility to, uh, to invest and, uh, and to give back to communities uh, uh, again, Microsoft has been extremely active for the uh, COVID use case, whether to be from uh, harnessing, you know, our engineering uh, engineers and uh, 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 and labs uh, to build uh, uh, respirators to uh, ensuring, you know, all of the startups that uh, sorry, ensuring uh, uh, hospitals are well equipped with uh, protective uh, gear and so on. And again, I'll basically kind of finishing up with uh, saying, I mean, uh, a lot of things that uh, I, I said was were uh, can be perceived as uh, as uh, as gimmicks or buzzwords or something like that. But uh, uh, in practice, uh, you know, we live and breathe that culture and those activities uh, every day. And uh, uh, kind of the recognition for that is uh, sorry, one of the recognitions for that is obviously. You know, being reflected in the in the stock price, and uh, uh, you can see it uh, uh, over here on this slide. Since uh, Satya basically came in 2014, the price share was uh, around uh, 40 dollars. Uh, this is an old slide, but it's actually now around uh, 180, right? So um, uh, you can see the scale uh, the business uh, had in uh, doing uh, Satya days. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up for questions or comments. Okay, thank you, Wes, for this interesting uh, talk. Um, so we're open for questions now. Um, if there are uh, any at this point of time, because I have many, so uh, maybe I can uh, start with one uh, with one question, Ross. Uh, sure. Out of our program, the Master of Innovation Entrepreneurship at Antwerp Management School, each year we have startups coming out of that, um, that we also try to connect with accelerators, to connect with investors and so on. Uh, if one of our startups sees a match with Microsoft and wants to come uh, to you guys to pitch, what are your tips and tricks that you can give to those uh, young entrepreneurs uh, what are you looking for and what is important when you pitch in front of Microsoft? Uh, really good question. So what I would say first is that um, uh, the startups that Microsoft uh, uh, is is looking for, uh, intentionally at least, are startups that can uh, leverage the Microsoft ecosystem, right? And those would mainly be uh, B2B, uh, again, that are already 
uh, that already have some working so working product might have uh, a couple of customers and so on right so we know how to work with uh, uh, entrepreneurs and startups like on the edge right like the b2c uh, pre-seed stage startup and we know how to work with unicorns but uh, for early stage uh, startups again the ones that are relatively getting started and um, and want to work with Microsoft, I would definitely think that uh, uh, if you get to a stage that uh, you have a working product, you have you know a couple of uh, reference customers, you have a, a, you know you start to expand to a, a, to other countries, uh, this is definitely the spot that you know for you to to engage Microsoft and uh, to leverage Microsoft. Um, um, and again, this is uh, the, the the main properties that uh, we would look at when we talk to uh, startups to onboard them to to our programs. Uh, beyond that, a, a lot of that is uh, alignment to our uh, culture. And again, like a few of the things that I uh, just mentioned, uh, again, it might sound a little bit uh, soft skills, but uh, I know uh, for a fact that there are some uh, you know, very interesting startups that Microsoft uh, looked at that uh, in the end uh, they passed on uh, uh, the investment or the uh, uh, or the acquisition uh, because the um, uh, culture of the startup wasn't aligned with the uh, culture of Microsoft, right? And uh, uh, again, it very depends, and you know, expectations are being set in place, but uh, it very depends on the on the startup uh, uh, stage, right? Like if you're just getting started and you're a team of uh, five people and you just got your first customer, nobody expects you to uh, take on a mission to uh, to uh, like to uh, uh, cure uh, Corona, but uh, uh, there is some expectation for you to uh, you know figure out, okay, so. If in two, three, five years you're going to scale, like how you're going to give back? How uh, how do you encourage your community? How do you encourage your uh, engineers like to you know, to achieve more? Hope it helps. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from Katarina. Looking at your professional pathway, what are your most what are you most proud of? And what role did your military service play for that achievement? We heard a lot about the military yeah. service that uh, also influenced the startup ecosystem. Uh, but that's a question from Katarina. Excellent. So uh, it, it's a really good question. And uh, one of the things that um, uh, I like, uh, I, I tend to think that uh, I have a, a a relatively uh, interesting um, a career path, and uh, the reason for that is that you know I graduated when I uh, finished university. I uh, had a, a, a diploma of, uh, in engineering, and a, a basically information system engineering. And uh, from uh, from there, you know, I was obviously a developer. I, I had some uh, basic skill with regards to uh, uh, QA, database management, and so on. And uh, basically, this is, was kind of the path that I was on, right? Like to to be a developer. Um, uh, because I had the entrepreneurial uh, bug, I actually, uh, you know, opened a, a tech company of did a little bit of uh, automation and uh, professional services around uh, cloud computing. But again, it was like in 2008, 2009, and then uh, the financial crisis came, and you know, I found myself like uh, in need to uh, uh, to find like a. Uh, let's call it like a nine to five uh, type of job. And uh, eventually I uh, ended up in uh, HP. And that actually uh, opened my eyes uh, to the fact that, you know, I, I love to the entrepreneurial spirit mainly because it gave me the opportunity to, uh, to interact with people, right? Which if you're a developer, it's something that you don't do uh, that often. And, uh, you know, I learned that there are like other positions and other roles that I'm less familiar with, which was a uh, pre-sale, uh, 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 which gave me the opportunity to be just on that borderline uh, between sales and uh, technical. Now, 
Uh, because suddenly I, I found myself, you know, with the toolkit and the experience of uh, being an engineer, being in, in an enterprise and being an entrepreneur, uh, my profile was uh, attractive for a young company uh, named Amazon Web Services back then uh, that was looking for somebody that has you know, basic skills uh, around the cloud tech, selling to enterprises and uh, an entrepreneurial spirit because back then um, AWS was truly a startup within Amazon. So when I joined, there was the 20th uh, employee in um, in EMEA, so Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and today that operation is probably more than 5,000 people, right? So uh, it was truly a startup in that sense. Uh, now the interesting point actually came when I uh, had to switch between, uh, you know, I, and I did a couple of roles within uh, AWS. I, you know, I opened the Israeli market, and then I told you kind of went into business development, but. During that period, you know, I switched from uh, having my, um, uh, how should I say, the, uh, uh, from using uh, Eclipse and uh, Visual Studio and writing uh, JavaScript, now my development platform is basically, you know, Outlook, right? And um, I almost completely forgot those kind of tech capabilities that I had in the past, which is something that I, you know, that I uh, regretted back then, but, uh, suddenly, I found myself uh, a generalist, right? Because uh, uh, the title that I had in the past uh, four years was business development, which means that I'm not a product guy. I'm not really a salesperson. I'm not really an engineer. I'm not really uh, a marketing person. Uh, and I kind of find my, found myself uh, like uh, a little bit confused of, you know, how do you uh, search for jobs? Like, how do you define yourself? How do you settle your career path, right? Like, what is the right thing? A, a really good book that helped me to kind of uh, figure out that uh, uh, that stage is a, a book called uh, a Range, which is, a, a, you know, it goes into the um, uh, differences of being a, a profession, like a, a true professional versus being a generalist, right? right. And uh, one of the examples that uh, that book uh, gives, which I love, is uh, the examples between uh, Roger Federer and uh, and uh, Tiger Woods. Now, uh, if you know the story of them, um, Tiger Woods basically held a, a, a golf club at the age of uh, two, and you know basically lived and breathed golf for you know from that moment to um, you know, to the moment that. Uh, uh, he became like uh, uh, the world champion and, uh, um, and, uh, and a world leader, right, in, uh, in the um, uh, field of expertise. Roger Federer, on the other end, uh, he basically started, I think, with uh, swimming, switched to soccer, switched to uh, chess, running, swimming, and then like only in the age of 13 or 14, uh, picked up like a, a tennis racket for the, for the first time. Now, uh, if you actually look at their statistics, you will see that... Uh, uh, Roger Federer, no, he's not the uh, number one uh, uh, serve. He doesn't have the, no, he's not the fastest one. He's not the, um, uh, like, he, he doesn't uh, he doesn't have the, the, stronger, the strongest teeth or anything, but he will be, like, at the top three of every category, right? So, uh, again, this is, you know, some of the parallels that, I, that I'm trying to keep in mind when I'm um, looking at the tools that I have in my uh, professional uh, career, like what are the things that I'm missing in order to um, improve that kind of uh, journalist uh, experience. Now, you asked specifically about the army. Uh, if you kind of uh, heard a little bit about the, uh, uh, you know, what I just described uh, before, so before the, uh, uh, university and you know uh, just after high school uh, I spent uh, four years in the army so three years is a mandatory service but because I was an officer I had like another year and a half that uh, extra that I had to uh, to do now uh, imagine that uh, at the age of uh, 21 you need to lead so my role in the uh, let's say the, the role that I did for the longest time in the army was uh, probably like a, a radio and communication officer in the in the Gaza Strip and uh, imagine that uh, at the age of uh, 20, 21, you need to uh, lead a platoon of uh, 30, 40 soldiers uh, across the 
uh, again, some technical expertise, but again, it was very tactical. Um, uh, in the um, uh, you know in the streets of Gaza, right? So it puts you in a situation that you know, no, honestly no, nobody should be. But uh, because we were already in this situation, uh, like I believe still that this is the time that uh, shaped the most the leadership skills that they have, right? Like uh, everything else is basically like kind of evolution of the. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's kind of evolution or building on top of that. Sorry, I'm, I know that I like I'm, I, I said anything, but I hope it uh, it answers your question. Okay, thank you very much, Shiraz. That was very interesting. Um, we have another question from uh, Katerina. You have mentioned uh, entrepreneurial spirit a lot now. Choosing the team members should have this spirit. How do you differentiate those uh, that talk the talk? From walking the talk, any tips there? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I, I'll start with the fact that again, it, it, nobody has like a crystal ball. So you know, eventually, it's uh, 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 there is a lot of room for for error, right? Uh, eventually, you need to have a, a skill to uh, judge people as as fast as possible when you're kind of onboarding new team members or when you're interviewing and so on. But uh, eventually, like one of th one of the things that I'm uh, telling uh, entrepreneurs that I'm working with uh, that need to choose their uh, you know their co-founder uh, is I mean find someone that can challenge you um, uh, and almost to the to a level that that annoys you, um, uh, but that you can still learn from from him or her, right? Like that's something that. Um, I mean, entrepreneurs are mostly kind of this, type, this kind of uh, type A personalities, move fast, uh, uh, tend to think that they have the answers for all. And uh, if you put uh, two of those uh, personalities together, many times, you know, there's, there's a conflict. Uh, if you can actually discuss and you can uh, have a, a interesting discussion about the pros and cons of you know, any kind of challenge or problem, it can be something... Uh, uh, you know, specific to the product, or it could be even like a philosophical discussion, just to see how, you know the, the chemistry of challenging one another and to inspire one another. Uh, you know, with interesting arguments uh, that you know for me be a, a, a relatively good indication. Okay, um, I have a question. You um, showed that Microsoft has a lot of different. Um, mechanisms let's say to connect with the uh, startup ecosystem which was really interesting um you can acquire you can invest you can take them in-house via a program and different programs that you run is there also a certain sequence in these uh, activities is that always the case that you take them and try to get to know them first and then you move further towards the acquisition um uh, activity or what is your on that so so overall like the short answer would be no like uh, we're trying to decouple those activities uh, because uh, you know it would be wrong of me to go to a startup and tell him like you know choose me work with me and uh, uh, microsoft microsoft will acquire you in a couple of years right like it's not uh, something that we could uh, uh, commit to and it's you know setting uh, false expectations uh, what we are trying to do is like to um uh, amplify uh, the the news and the word on interesting startups and use cases that we're running into. So I'll give an example. A, a company called uh, The Tree. They have like a, a, a GitHub uh, policy management, and you know we onboard them to uh, to our program. And uh, because of uh, uh, the work that we've done with them, and because of the uh, use case they have, we actually thought it would be useful also for our marketing team to and uh, um, uh, and the evangelism team to to get to know them, right? So we introduced them. One thing led to another. They uh, ended up like uh, opening a, a GitHub a user group in Israel, which is now have I think like like 1,000 members, right? And because again we saw that that was working well, and you know there was good. Uh, uh, feedback and motivation from the from the founders. So you know, uh, you you get to a point that you're 
motivated to do the above and beyond, right? So we got them in touch with uh, the business development team uh, with uh, GitHub, which is you know obviously very strategic to their product. Uh, and now they kind of uh, have access to uh, you know, to roadmap and uh, uh, product teams within GitHub that, again, for them, it's a... Uh, uh, it it made a huge difference with regards to you know how they develop the product, how do they think about uh, the customers and so on, right? So it's usually kind of something you no know, one on top of the other in that thing. Uh, but uh, again, as uh, uh, Katrina kind of mentioned before, uh, a lot of that has to do with regards to you know the person in front of you, a person personal connection that you have to uh, to the founder. The uh, you want to. Uh, do that above and beyond to uh, uh, founders that are more, um, uh, you know, responsive uh, um, and, and seem truly really passionate about you know working with you. Okay, thank you, Wes. You also presented quite interesting uh, figures on the uh, Israeli ecosystem. Um, there's a question from Andris. Uh, do you have an idea of the percentage of capital from the exits realized by Israeli people that comes back to Israel? It seems from previous sessions also, it seems relatively high. Do you have an explanation for this? So so I don't remember the exact number, so please, uh, again, feel free to double check me. But if I recall correctly, I think that the... Um, a, a high tech industry is around like 15% of the or 10 or 15% of the GDPR sorry of the uh, GDP of um, uh, uh, of Israel right so so it it is quite high uh, there is a lot of conversations uh, around you know the um, uh, anything from uh, taxation to uh, uh, employment uh, 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 limitations and uh, those kind of things that are being done because uh, imagine that, uh, again, uh, if you remember the slide that I mentioned before, that uh, there are 300 uh, multinationals that are operating in Israel. Uh, you know, obviously these are well-established companies that can uh, 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 be very attractive for engineers. Uh, with, with that kind of... Um, a, let's say landscape. How does a early stage startup can be attractive for a data scientist, uh, you know, to come to work with them, right? So um, you know, th these are kind of interesting uh, conversation and uh, topics that uh, we are keeping tr that, that we keep finding ourselves in to you know, to try to uh, support the ecosystem from that front. Um, we also talked about um, how open the Israeli ecosystem uh, is. Uh, we noticed that a lot of uh, startup activity is, of course, uh, coming from uh, Israel. But how easy is it for a foreign uh, entrepreneur, let's say someone from Belgium or someone from France, to enter this uh, Israeli uh, ecosystem uh, with a startup or with a startup ID even? So, so uh, I'd say this much, like, I mean, coming uh, on your own search up in Israel and, you know, um, uh, trying to uh, to make it, I mean, uh, to be completely honest, it, it might be a little bit uh, overwhelming, but uh, the good thing is that there are so many supportive mechanisms uh, that are based in Israel uh, that, can, uh, that can ease a lot of those kind of pain points uh, uh, that you might have, right? So uh, just to give an example, uh, if you have solutions around uh, uh, automotive, so you know you can um, partner with uh, uh, Honda, Hyundai, uh, Volkswagen, Porsche, uh, 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 Ford, like all of them have, you know, accelerators or innovation uh, uh, programs uh, that are based in Israel. Uh, if you're, you know, if, even like from, uh, the the country level, I know that uh, let's say uh, also you know Japan, uh, La French Tech, uh, Portugal, uh, specifically for for Belgium, like I'm 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 I don't remember, but there are definitely like th there are some programs you now even from the EU that are being run in Israel, right? So uh, there are a lot of tools and resources available. Now the country itself is relatively friendly for foreigners, right? So, you know, everything from 
uh, like it's an immigrant country, obviously, from the uh, last 50, like 70 years or so, but uh, all of the signage is in English or the street's name, all of the, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 files and paperwork and all, all those kind of things are also available in English, right? So it's relatively um, uh, friendly for uh, internationals to, to come and uh, set up over here. Okay, so thank you, uh, Raz, and we hope uh, to visit Tel Aviv one day after the uh, uh, Corona crisis is, uh, is over. So thank you very much for... Uh, Looking forward. Yeah presenting all these uh, interesting insights and for uh, paying it forward to uh, Russ. So thank you very much for doing this. Of course, thank you so much. Thank you. And here I close the, uh, the session, uh, the three webinars that we had uh, this morning and also the uh, Tel Aviv part of the uh, strategy tour, which is part of the Master of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we had three interesting uh, perspectives on uh, corporate venturing and corporate innovation. And uh, I hope to see you soon at uh, uh, one of the uh, future uh, AMS uh, events online or I either on our campus uh, in Antwerp. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.